Sandeep, can we begin? No, oh, he will give the. Yeah, we are live. A uh, very good morning to yet another Momentum webinar to all the viewers. Momentum, as we all know, is a promotional event, a promotional academic event uh, hosted by the Maharashtra Orthopedic Association and the Bombay Orthopedic Society to promote IOCON Mumbai, which will be held in the last quarter of next year, that is 2021. Today, we are privileged to have one of the more academically inclined and one of the oldest arthroscopy associations in the country. The Indian Arthroscopy Association was started on the 1st of January, 1983, and it was started by stalwarts from Mumbai and the Western region, which is uh, Dr. Dinesh Patel and Dr. P.H. Vora. And hence, it is our privilege that today we are sharing our platform with them as the invited association. May I now call upon the organizing president and chairman uh, of the IOCON 2020 and the president of the Maharashtra Orthopedic Association, Dr. Ajit Shinde, who will give his opening remarks. That would be followed by the BOS president and co-organizing chairman of IOCON, Dr. Mohanty, Dr. Parak Sancheti, who is the conference director for IOCON 2020. And that would be followed by our very own organizing secretary of IACON, Dr. Ram Chetta. So I now hand over the proceedings to Dr. Ajit Shinde. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Sapneel. Good morning, friends. Greeting from Maharashtra. I, Dr. Ajit Shinde, president of Maharashtra Orthopedic Association and organizing chairman of IACON Mumbai, welcome you all in this fantastic webinar a part of Momentum series, which is a Maharashtra Orthopedic Association, Bombay Orthopedic Society initiative of IOCON 2020 organizing team, as mentioned by Dr. Sapneel Kenny. Topic of today's webinar look quite interesting, something which is innovative and advanced. I'm excited to hear the talks. So this time we have Indian Arthroscopic Society with us. I thanks Dr. IPS Oberai and Dr. Samanta for their overhead participation. We have excellent panel across the country, all masters of arthroscopy. I welcome Dr. Deepak Goyal from Ahmedabad, Dr. Jitendra Mahaswari from Delhi, Dr. Ayappan Nair from Bengaluru, Dr. P. Gopinathan from Calicut, Dr. Milin Pimperkar from Nashik. Also, we have video presentation on various fascinating topics by eminent surgeons, Dr. Shreyesh Gutzar from Mumbai, Dr. S.R. Sundar Rajan from Koyimtur, Dr. Abhijit Vehgaokar from Pune, Dr. Darshan Jain from Bengaluru, and Dr. Swarendu Samanta from Kolkata. Arthroscopy has its own virtues and it has been born in the field of orthopedic surgery. Who would have thought of doing ankle fusion orthoscopically back in 1980s? Scope of orthopedic surgeries has widened tremendously. Past few decades and it is still evolving. Now I won't take much of the time. My best message for all the faculties and I hand over the mic to our convener, Dr. Pradeep and Dr. Sandeep. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank Good you very morning. much, sir. I think we should uh, now invite Dr. Uh, Mohanty to speak a few words. Mohanty, sir. Good morning. Good morning, dear friends. Uh, greetings from Mumbai and uh, Bombay Orthopedic Society. Welcome to this uh, excellent webinar uh, today. And uh, as we know now, the Ganpati festival is on uh, for the 10 days, uh, and it's the biggest festival in Maharashtra, Mumbai, as well as all over the India. But uh, this is shadowed by the pandemic now, but our academics has not been shadowed by the pandemic. So being a member of Indian Orthopedic Association and uh, Maharashtra Orthopedic Association and on behalf of the Bombay Orthopedic Society, 
the academic thirst will be quenched today and uh, today the elegant indian arthroscopy, arthroscopy society is the guest chapter and we welcome uh, the president uh, dr ips oberai and my friend uh, secretary of indian arthroscopy society uh, dr sonendu samanta uh, to take this forward thank you very much for joining today and you know ias is an elegant term in india ias means indian administrative service and uh, indian arthroscopy society is also equally elegant like a uh, ias post uh, in india thank you very much and uh, i wish the webinar a great success today and all of us will quench our thirst today regarding the arthroscopy thank you now i hand over to dr parag sanchiti the conference director for iocon 2020 which is moving towards uh, iocon 2021 now thank you uh, parag sir Parag is there. He is just to, you have to unmute him. Parag, you are there. Yeah, Parag, Parag joined that time. Parag joined. His video is not there. I think he is not there. You can. Okay, we can move it with uh, Dr. Ram Chedda first. Then uh, we can uh, take. Sir, Dr. Parag, Parag sir is there. Now. Yeah, yeah, he is there. Right. Okay. Parag sir. Over to yeah. you. So I know welcome Dr. Shu Prakash. Good morning, everybody. It's indeed a, a great pleasure to see all of you today for this uh, webinar, and uh, the webinar is with in association with Indian Arthroscopy Society, and it's indeed a great pleasure for me to uh, welcome uh, all the dignitaries here. Special thanks to Dr. I P S Oberai for really you know agreeing to be here as as a last minute, and also a dynamic secretary. Dr. Shivendu, and uh, we really uh, feel very privileged to be associated with the Indian Arthroscopy Society, which is our own society. And uh, I can see the president when I was the secretary of IIS here, Dr. Nicholas Santhu, uh, and uh, this is a very dear society to my heart. So it's really nice that the the momentum has uh, selected IIS for uh, this uh, webinar today. the topics are great and we have a great faculty and uh, you know in preparation to the ioa con which is now 2021 i think all these star faculties are going to be useful and this is also this webinar is a step towards the preparation of uh, the scientific content of ioa con 2021 which will be uh, held in mumbai so i think that's it's a great initiative and every time we learn on how to improve the scientific content with each webinar i wish to uh, thank all the organizers for this uh, my president dr ajit shinde who has been you know in spite of various odds in last week he has been very uh, focused and uh, working uh, very much towards uh, the iocon 2021 and taking moa to great heights so welcome and thank you dr shinde sir i don't see our secretary dr karane but uh, thanks to him also and all the uh, back office work which is done by sandeep and uh, dr sonavne is really great and uh, very soon we will hear dr ram chadda who is going to tell us a little about the 2021 and he is uh, the person who is uh, like uh, the main and he has the what we call the hub and spoke model so he is the hub and we all are the spokes and he really does a great job so thank you ram and welcome all the faculty dr deepak uh, dr uh, milind dr shreyas uh, dr sundar rajan dr darshan dr nayar dr gopinathan uh, maheshwari sir uh, ips oberai abhijit vai dr pune rajendra it's really my pleasure to see all of you and i thank once again swapnil sandeep and the whole team for making these webinars a reality thank you very much and i urge all of you to start registering for the iocon 2021 and uh, please have a look at the website and uh, please guide us on how to organize this meeting thank you very much thank you parag thank you very much thank you so much dr ajit shinde dr kanti dr parag santhi it is indeed a pleasure to be addressing this elite group of minimally invasive surgeons in our country uh, it's a passion which i could never uh sort of execute which was uh, arthroscopy because i had brilliant people like each one of you who were my colleagues 
you have managed to actually entice a few exciting spine surgeons like Gopinath, who was a very, very aggressive spine surgeon at one time also into arthroscopy. And I, I, I really love this. Today, we are all in, let's say, the acceptance phase of the pandemic. We've gone from a denial to an acceptance. We've gone from denial to anger, to bargaining, to depression. And according to Elizabeth Kubler loss, we are finally in the stage of acceptance. But gentlemen, may I share with you, we cannot lower our guard. We are entering on day two of our festival season. And it's my humble request in your own small way, we as doctors cannot lower our guard. Whatsoever may be happening around us, please, We've gone from denial to acceptance, but we have to accept the new normal. So please be careful, stay safe, and do not have your family feel sorry later. Humble submission to each one of you. So please play the cards which have been dealt out to us to the best <clears throat> of our abilities. We promise you that IACON 2021, which is now moved by a year into the last quarter of 2021, will live up to each one of your expectations. And it's our request that you continue with this momentum and this vigor so that we can reach that culmination into a lovely face-to-face -face conference, which is beyond what we've envisaged today. Thank you all for your support. And please have an academic two hours where you will indulge in not just discussions, case presentations, but also some beautiful video presentations. All the best and over to the conveners. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. So before we hand over uh, to our uh, uh, moderators, I would like to request uh, IAS president, Dr. IPS Oberai to say a few words. Then maybe he may be allowed to leave after this because he's traveling. Please, sir. Yes, IPS. You have to unmute IPS. You have to unmute. We are muted. Thank you, Sandeep. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Shinde. Uh, thank you, Dr. Monty. Uh, I think uh, collaboration with the uh, Indian Arthroscopy Society and MOA and BUS for IUA Momentum uh, program is uh, really appreciated. Uh, I'm looking forward for hearing uh, from stalwarts of arthroscopy surgery, including Dr. Maheshwari, uh, Dr. Uh, Patel, Deepak Patel, Dr. Milind, uh, Shreyash, my friend Sundar Rajan, uh, our young colleagues like Darshan Shah and uh, uh, definitely uh, Dr. Ayappa Nayar and Dr. Gopinath. So I think it's an excellent faculty which is there and I think uh, I must, uh, I'm looking forward for hearing this. I would go offline and then go to a YouTube channel to listen it. I appreciate the collaboration and uh, Indian Arthroscopy Society will be an active partner in the coming IOCon 2021. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, sir. So I will hand over all the proceedings to our uh, uh, both the moderators, Dr. Nicholas Anta, who himself was the president of Indian Arthroscopy Society, as well as Bombay Orthopedic Society, and Dr. Milind Sintrikar, sir. Please, sir. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Anta and Milind, sir. And really, it's a pleasure to see this great faculty. And we are looking forward to the lovely talks. Okay, can we... Uh... All right, I must, uh, on my behalf and uh, on behalf of uh, Milin, we must thank the organizers for giving us this opportunity to moderate this uh, wonderful IOA Momentum Seminar. Uh, I will now call upon uh, Dr. Uh, Deepak Goel. Uh, if uh, today uh, India is on the world map of cartilage work is because of uh, the efforts put in by uh, Deepak Goyal. He is uh, president of the uh, Asian Catholic Society, a pioneer who started the work in uh, India and uh, also a member of uh, various societies and a traveling professor of the Department of Orthopedics in Hiroshima Society. Um, he also been a, a board member of the International uh, Cartilage uh, Repair Society and I am sure one day in a few years time, he'll be the president of the International Cartilage Society also. Over to you, Deepak, go ahead. 
Thank you, Professor Antao, for a nice introduction. And at the outset, I would like to thank Bombay Orthopedic Society, Maharashtra Orthopedic Association, Indian Arthroscopy Society, and IOA for organizing such a wonderful program and for inviting me. This is the topic which is very close to my heart, and I will try to give my best today. So, friends, uh, I'll be talking on autologous chondrocyte implantation, and I have no conflict of interest to report. And uh, how this moves? Okay. So, autologous chondrocyte implantation technique was first conceptualized by Professor Lars Peterson in 1983, and then further it was discussed with Mats Bridberg, and both of them started doing ACI in around 1988. And the first paper was published in uh, NAGM in 1994. It was around 23 cases which they published. And since then, this technique had been maximally criticized and had undergone maximum critical analysis. But finally, it got US FDA approval. And now it is used worldwide after local approvals from various countries. I'm privileged that I got trained by the inventors themselves in 2005. And I'm doing ACI since 2005 in India. Uh, when we talk about ACI procedure, we must know that what is the ideal case for ACI procedure. So friends, we don't treat MRI, we don't treat X-ray, we treat patients. The patient has to be symptomatic. And any cartilage lesion seen on MRI doesn't warrant an ACI procedure. The patient has to be symptomatic. The patient has to be young to middle age. The size of the defect should be mid to big size. Because for small to mid size lesions, we have other procedures that gives equally good results. Say, for example, if there is a lesion of one centimeter square, a single plug of mosaic plastic will give fantastic result. And we don't want to use a costly AI pro ACI procedure or two-stage ACI procedure for small or small mid-size lesions. So this procedure is advocated for mid-size to large-size lesions. The lesion has to be ICRS grade three and four. That means the lesion thickness should be more than 50% of the cartilage thickness. If the lesion is more than 50% or reaching up to the bone, then only we should do the cartilage repair procedure. It should be a biomechanically normal knee and the lesion should be non-degenerative and non-pathological lesion. Saying this, this condition is not indicated for degenerative procedure and we should keep that in mind. So before I start uh, history of ACI in brief, initially the biopsy used to be taken from supramedial edge of medial trochlea or superlateral edge of lateral trochlea. A small tiny pieces of cartilage were taken and it is sent to cartilage lab through transport media along with patient serum. And in the laboratory, these pieces were minced into smaller pieces and then they were subjected to enzymatic digestion process so that chondrocytes are isolated. And those chondrocytes which were isolated were put in monolayer culture. So in monolayer culture, we expect these cells which are around 200 to 300 cells to grow into 1 million cells and 1 million cells are required for one centimeter square defect. That means that if you have a four centimeter square defect, we should ask laboratory to give us 4 million cells. Now, when the culture is over in four to six weeks time, the laboratory will call back the surgeon and inform that the date of delivery of the cells. And then the second stage surgery is required where if the lesion is irregular, it has to be made sharp cut, regular in size with stable margins. Then we need to take a periosteal graft from upper sheen of the tibia and put into the defect. This periosteum needs to be sutured on the defect with the PDS suture 60, and then fibrin glue is put all around. So there it becomes a watertight compartment and then live chondrocytes are injected underneath the periosteum. So this is how the first generation ACI was carried out in 1990s to 2000. But this procedure had its problem because it required harvestum of periosteum. And that means an extra surgery over here, an extra time for harvest. The another problem was that around 20 to 40 percent of the cases had overgrown cartilage because of periosteal hypertrophy. So like this, uh, the periosteum used to overgrow and that used to cause mechanical impingement. It, sometimes it also got calcified and led to delamination. So the second generation came where periosteum was removed and instead of periosteum, a collagen membrane was used to suture onto the defect and the cells were <clears throat> implanted underneath the collagen membrane. However, the problem still continued because we can use second generation membrane, but we could not suture the defect into corners of the tibia. We cannot reach there and it is very difficult to suture over there. We cannot make a watertight compartment and it will lead to unequal distribution of the cells. 
so surgeons thought that why not implant the cells in the membrane itself in the laboratory and put that membrane into the defect so that was the start of messy procedure where membranes were associated with chondrocyte culture cultured cells and put into the defect and then there was further evolution and then there came that it is a two dimensional defect and why for a two dimensional defect we are putting for a three dimensional defect why we are putting a two dimensional membrane and let us have a three dimensional scaffold and we put 3d scaffold into the defect the advantage of 3d scaffold was that it led to homogeneous distribution of the cells because it was prepared in laboratory it was mechanically flexible and it could be cut into the different sizes so that is how the evolution of aci procedure took place we are lucky in india that we are we did not have first generation aci we did not have second generation aci we did not have earlier third generation aci but we have what we have in india is gel based aci so we use gel which is impregnated with chondrocytes and that we implant over the defect in india the advantage of gel is that it takes on any irregular lesion we don't have to prepare the lesion into circular or square form and any irregular lesion the gel takes over the shape so i'll just demonstrate few steps of uh, chondral biopsy <clears throat> <coughs> So we take a biopsy from supralateral corner of trochlea. We ensure that the limb is in full extension. This is a 4 mm harvester. We put a footprint of it on lateral border of trochlea to ensure that we are going to impact it at the correct place. And then we gradually impact the harvester. It is a 5 mm mark over here, and we should impact for 5 mm to ensure that the bone, the subchondral bone, is also taken out. Sometimes, if you don't feel the bone, you may impact it for. 10 mm once you have done the impaction you rotate it gradually and remove it so that will remove a cylinder of cartilage and the bone both if you look at the gy biopsy this is 4 mm biopsy with the cartilage cap and bone underneath actually we just need the cartilage and we don't need the bone you can look at the patient screen this is how the biopsy has been harvested from lateral trochlea and the knee should be in full extension at the time of taking the biopsy so you do not Uh, take the biopsy from weight bearing zone the next step is that biopsy is sent to the laboratory where the cartilage is separated after enzymatic digestion then it is subjected to various culture and passage procedures and finally there is a harvest stage when we get culture chondrocytes at this stage laboratory informs the doctor that the graft is ready and we plan a second surgery i am showing you a case of patellar cartilage defect i do a mini arthrotomy i like to do a medial parapatellar arthrotomy i like to keep my incision 1 cm medial to patella so that there is a good soft tissue attached to the patella which will help me in eversion of patella so the incision is just from lower end of patella to upper end of patella and uh, this is how the backpack is used to evert the patella the second step is we remove the synovial folds and fat tissues so that the patella is released further and we can we are able to evert it more the third step is assessment of the size of the lesion now if you look all oh, this area is grade 4 bone deep which we can feel but this area looks little bit unstable on probing probably there is a fluid underneath and That's that is why this morning. area is unstable so we will go further and decide fourth step is using a 15 mm knife or 11 mm knife put a sharp cut cut deep onto the bone at the healthy healthy cartilage and try to demarcate the border between unhealthy cartilage and healthy cartilage now you can see when i'm putting a cut over here this part is little bit wobbling so this is unstable cartilage i'm trying to save as much as possible but if later i found that this is unstable i will remove this corner as well so you use sharp knife to have cut bone deep and separate the healthy cartilage from unhealthy cartilage next step is to separate and remove the degenerated or damaged cartilage from the subchondral bone at the cementing layer level you used uh, sharp periosteum to do that it's not easy to peel it off because some of the cartilage is still very well attached to the cementing layer and some of the cartilage is easy to separate because it is already detached but that is how you clear the surface and the prepare the base finally i found that this corner was unstable so i removed that unstable area from the cartilage because i wanted to have healthy margin all around so this is how a sharp cut healthy margins are created all around the lesion and then it is ready for implantation 
now we create a 45 degree a bevel the 45 degree bevel is required so that the base is more wider than the top this helps in anchoring of the graph otherwise graph may get peeled off so i use my knife and put a 45 degree angle and make a, another sharp cut to create margins accordingly finally the base is prepared i put small anchor holes three or four which should not penetrate the full bone it should just have a small entry into the cortical bone that will further enhance the anchoring of the gel based aci on its base and then the final step comes it is a y syringe connector with two syringes one syringe has got thrombin with live chondrocytes and other syringe has got fibrinogen when both gets together by drop by drop it forms a scaffold the scaffold is formed of fibrin and in this fibrin scaffold the chondrocytes are impregnated so a layer by layer chondrocytes are laid onto the defect along with the fibrin which works as a scaffold now the beauty is that as we put drop by drop any irregular shape we can cover we did not have a round or circular defect to do that and we can assess how much more layers we need to put so it is basically a three dimensional layout of aci onto the defect and uh, we keep on doing it till we reach the surface then i like to put little more aci on top of it so that if you look from silhouette you will know that the graft is little proud from the surrounding cartilage the graft must be little bit proud less than 1 mm proud because the fibrin has a tendency to contract when fibrin will contract it will shrink in size so i want my graft little bit more proud so that even if it shrinks it remains at level so you can look from silhouette silhouette the graft is little bit proud and uh, proud from the surrounding cartilage now see you can see here it is little bit proud less than 1 mm and that is required because it will little bit it will shrink a little bit afterwards so this is how the aci is implanted onto the cartilage defect and this is the final lesion then we should evert the patella and do a knee movement and check whether it is stable or not and then we do the closure so this lady was 35 years old and now 6.5 years of follow up this was her pre operative mri you can see the healthy looking cartilage which i was little bit in doubt has a fluid interface over here so that means this cartilage was also going to fail in short period of time and this is another area which was visible defect which is bone deep so after 6 and 1/2 years you can see a well homogeneous regrown cartilage repair with smooth margins in both the views the cartilage has well integrated with the surrounding normal cartilage and the structure of the cartilage is homogeneous with the native cartilage in actual view also you can see the fluid interface with normal looking cartilage above it and the cartilage defect the whole cartilage defect and after 6 and 1/2 years there is a homogeneous cartilage with smooth surface and good integration to the surrounding normal cartilage in uh, in every location another patient which i had operated 8 years before he had a dumbbell shape defect you can look at it is a dumbbell shape defect or you can look at dumbbell shape defect so he had two defects with less lesion at apex of patella this was the aci done on him at 8 years and you can see follow up a thickly regenerated cartilage which is homogeneous and it is well merged with the surrounding cartilage with smooth surface in this case it is little overgrown if you can see here it is little overgrown and sometimes this little overgrowth can give a little bit uh, clicking sound but if it is minor it is okay if it is more then you might need to shave it off but not always so looking to the literature is it a hype or a substance uh, i'll just four more slides professor antao so nutsen in 2004 published a paper in jbgs and he said that aci versus microfracture there is no clinical arthroscopic and histological difference but what he did not report in his conclusion was that microfracture patients with more than 4 cm square lesion were had worse results while aci any size lesion the results were same the same group published another paper again level 1 study at 5 years follow up and again they concluded that there is no clinical and arthroscopical or histological difference between microfracture and aci but again what they did not Uh, report in conclusion but reported in results was that aci cases that did well at 2 years did well at 5 years also while microfracture cases that did well at 2 years failed at 5 years so these were the two highlights which were hidden in their conclusion 
and then the same group again published 15 years of follow up level 1 study in 2016 and again they concluded there is no significant difference between the two groups survivorship and etc to that freddie foot wrote a letter to jbgs editors and in the letter to jbgs he wrote that the study was designed in 1919 and 2022 where 2020 where it was a periosteum aci or first generation aci and the acis evolved much after that Periosteal hypertrophy and delaminations were known complication after first generation of ACI, and he included that complication as failure. One out of four center had a failure rate of 60%. That means one center out of four had a great learning curve for ACI, and that center should have been excluded from the results, but that was not excluded. And 28% of the cases had osteochondral defect. Now it is a known fact that if it is an osteochondral defect, you need to reconstruct the subchondral bone also before doing an ACI procedure. But subchondral bone was not reconstructed in 28% of the patients. That means 28% patients were doomed to be a failure from day one. So this is the literature, how you interpret it. Another literature, Vasilides published a Cochrane review in 2010. And we all believe Cochrane review for evidence. And he concluded, there is insufficient evidence to draw conclusion on the use of ACI for treatment of full thickness cartilage defects. So I agree. If Cochrane says there is no efficient evidence, we agree to it. But look what happened after that. He, another paper was published in 2010 where the conclusion was ACI has emerged as an effective and durable solution for the treatment of large full thickness cartilage and osteochondral defects. Our study suggests that clinical and functional outcome remain high even 10 to 20 years after the implantations. And you know who was the author of this paper? Again, the Vasilides. That means Professor Vasilides in 2010 and 11 published two papers. One paper was a Cochrane review where he suggested there is inefficient, insufficient data to support ACI. And in another paper in the same year, he concluded that ACI has emerged as an effective and durable solution for the treatment of large full thickness chondral and osteochondral lesions at long-term follow-up. I'm not saying that one of these papers is wrong, but what I'm trying to say is that if you are looking for strong evidence for ACI for long-term, we don't have. But if you are looking for good results for ACI, we do have. It is, and that's how we have to interpret. Now, why this is happening? There was one paper by me in 2013 in Arthroscopy Journal where we concluded, it was a level two study, and it concluded that there is a strong evidence in favor of ACI at two years follow-up for mid-sized defects in younger age group. So we have strong evidence for two years follow-up. But there was another paper by me in uh, Asian Indian Arthroscopy Journal recently published where we concluded that because there is a constant evolution taking place from first generation to second generation, second to third generation. Any generation is not getting enough time to produce long-term follow-up. Now we are taking third generation ACI, but third generation ACI should have more time to show a long-term results. But before it shows a long-term results, a new evolution is coming. And when new evolution is coming, we are not able to show the long-term results. And that is where probably we will continue to see mid-term good results with high level of evidence, but probably we will, it will be very difficult to see a long-term results of third generation ACI. So friends, I would like to conclude that ACI is science of cells and scaffolds. If you provide live cultured chondrocytes and if you provide a means of scaffold that is stable enough, there should be good cartilage regeneration. I really do not doubt any of that part, but we should know that ACI is indicated for mid to large size defect, ICRS grade three or four, focal chondral defect in young to middle age patients. The ACI is not recommended for degenerative procedures. There are companies who try to sell their products for degenerative cases or as an alternative to TKR. No, this is not an alternative to TKR. It is for focal chondral lesions and we should not forget about that. All ACI are not same. It is evolving and it will continue to evolve. And we need to understand that most problems that were encountered with first generation ACI are already addressed by third generation ACI. But there are more problems for third generation ACI, mainly a two-stage procedure. And some evolution should take place in future. There is a strong evidence in favor of ACI for mid-term results. But for long-term evidence of ACI, 
probably we need to take more time. We need to wait before we can conclude that the third generation ACI has a long-term evidence or not. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Deepak, for a very informative uh, uh, lecture, tracing the history of ACI and demonstrating a very nice, uh, succinct uh, way of doing uh, ACI implantation. Uh, we have Thank some you. questions for you. Uh, yes. Dr. Deepak, uh, finally, when you take the, this thing, you only take the cartilage pieces. Why do you take the yes. piece of bone, so much of subcondal bone? And then yes. you, have, you are left with uh, donor site morbidity. And second question yes. is the age limit of, for this procedure. Okay. So the answer to first question is, actually, I'm also not happy why we need to take the bone. Because uh, the company which provides ACI in India recommends or they provide a harvester to take the biopsy and then have the property of that harvester is until the bone is also removed. So that is why, because they use a mosaic plastic instrument technology to take the biopsy and that is fallacy of the instrument. And I think I have recommended to the company many times that, that you should come out with a better instrument which takes only the cartilage part. But the second reason, the excuse or reason given by a company to me is that they want the basal cartilage layer for culturing. And if the a surgeon takes only the superficial part of cartilage as a biopsy, and if the superficial part has less cells, and if it is not good enough to culture the cells, they might have to ask for a repeat biopsy. That means a repeat surgery. So to avoid that, they are recommending to take the bone part so it is ensured that the basal cartilage is taken in the biopsy. That is one uh, answer which uh, I can give for the biopsy question. And for the age limit, I think my age limit is physiological 50. When I'm saying physiological 50, I have done ACI in one or two cases who were around 52, 54, but they were very active, very young, no associated disease, no comorbidities. And I took, uh, I did ACI in them. And in some of the cases, even a 45-year-old obese lady having a different mm -hmm. joint pains and multiple systemic disease, I have said no to them. So a physiological age of 50 for me is a good endpoint. And beyond that, we should be very careful. Any other question from the faculty? Oh, can I ask Anto? Yes, please. Yeah, yes, Deepak, sir. in these two cases that you have shown, did you do a tibial tuberosity or osteotomy as well? Uh, both of the cases were biomechanically normal. As I said in my first slide, that the first condition of ACI is that the joint should be biomechanically normal. Or if it is not biomechanically abnormal, then we have to do a biomechanical correction simultaneously. But both these cases were biomechanically normal. The TTTG was normal. There was no patella alta or baha. There was no trochlear dysplasia. So we did not do any TT transfer. Uh, uh, yes, Miri has a question. Yes. Uh, Mili, Mili, Mili. Yeah, the, Deepak. Yes, sir. Uh, you just said that uh, you showed the case of the uh, patella mm -hmm. defect, mm -hmm. and you said that your upper limit is about 50 years. Yes. So, I always have uh, been wondering that what are the indications where you do this? Are they, aren't they degenerative cartilage defects at the age of 50? No. And what, I... is the, what is the reason for that isolated patella defect hmm. uh, of this kind? You know, do, do uh, you feel that traumatic so, ones? No. So there are two types of cases that comes at a younger age. Most of the, the executives who have a long sitting job, do not have much of a physical job, they develop patella chondromalacia at around 30 to 40 years of age. And they develop patella cartilage defect. Now the patella cartilage defect is of two types, the overuse injury and underuse injury. Most of the time, medial patellar facet will have an underuse cartilage defect or underuse chondromalacia, and lateral patellar facet will have overuse chondromalacia. Right. So both these conditions arrive in young people or around 30 to 45 years of age who are more into their work, involved in their uh, profession, doing less physical work, and then they suddenly realize that they have got knee pains, anterior knee pain, and then they start going to gym. And then they are active for four to five months in the gym. And then they develop, first it was a medial patellar facet lesion, and then they develop a little patellar facet lesion. So these are the main group where we have a patellar lesion developing. 
The second group which uh, requires this kind of procedure is a patellar condyle defect due to either injury or a patellar condyle defect due to uh, OCD. Now, OCD is very much uncommon in patella, but it is very common in medial femoral condyle and little less common in trochlea. So, most of these cases, the indications are first traumatic, secondly, OCD, and third is a limited overuse or underuse injury. Degenerative, never. So, uh, when you say that these are chondromalacia, now Alfonso's mm -hmm. paper, if you really study, the chondromalacia, particularly the basic cause is biomechanical derangement. So, it's a tight ITB, tight lateral structures. Uh, yes, I yeah. Yes. So what, what happens to these patients? Now you said that the indication is they should be biomechanically aligned. Yes. So if they have so, a maltracking of the patella, so do you correct them pre -op? No. So I'll, I'll tell you. See, basically the patellar cartilage lesions are considered as black hole of orthopedics. The science is yet not complete because there are so many conditions when you see that everything is normal, still patient has a cartilage defect. It is a complex biomechanics involving hip, knee, ankle, and foot, and also the core of the patient. And in most of the cases, we do find some abnormality in soft tissues when the bones are normal. As you said, the quadriceps contracture, hamstring contracture, ITB contracture, or other things. Or sometimes there is a weakness of muscles, like gluteus are weak, or quadriceps are weak, or hamstring is weak, and that is leading to lesion. So we never jump on patellar cartilage defect on day one. My hospital protocol is minimum six months of physiotherapy and rehabilitation before a decision for surgery is taken, right? So, and that six months is, in my hospital, it is like it is compulsory that they have to have that uh, physiotherapy of six months under my vision. The reason being that if you ask them to do physiotherapy and they go to some XYZ physiotherapy, you are never sure whether they are doing proper physiotherapy or not. So they have to go to a place where, you know, I can cross-check that whether they are doing it or not. And on day when I tell them that this is the trial of physiotherapy, if you make your joint supple and if you make your muscles strong and still if you have a pain, then we plan to operate this thing. But frankly, out of 100, 40, 50, 60% of the patients, they improve. On another 40, 50% of patients, they do not improve. Okay. Now we uh, thank yes, you, Dr. Deepak. Uh, we now. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we now go to thank Dr. Uh, Maheshwari. Uh, thank you. Dr. Maheshwari does not require introduction in this audience. He is like a father figure and a man which can participate in all kinds of uh, symposium and webinars. We always have a word of wisdom uh, in the cases that is presented. Uh, he. He is the director of the Max uh, Super Specialty Hospital in New Delhi. Uh, uh, if all the orthopedic surgeons remember him, is because of his uh, uh, textbook, Essential of Orthopedics, which everybody is like a Bible. And he is one of the first guys in India, uh, in, especially in North India, who started the shoulder and uh, knee joint clinic. Over to you, Dr. Uh, uh, Maheshwari. Thanks, Anthal. I hope I'm audible. Yes, yes, very much. Okay. So, in last four months, uh, there have been a series of webinars on osteotomies. And I have attended each one of them. And so, like, so good, some of them, or most of them, I would say. And the top people in the world actually were presenting. People like Hirvardhan and everybody else. So it was one topic which was very extensively discussed in Corona period. And when I asked my junior colleagues, some of them expressed that they've rather got confused because all these great people talk so much into minute details of what they're doing that it becomes almost intimidating to an average normal orthopedic surgeon. And that feeling uh, I, was not good feeling for me that you can't teach people to intimidate them to do what they were doing till yesterday quite okay, if not excellent. So I thought, let me just put my thoughts into this. As, I, as you said, when you're 60 plus, you get this permit to talk about eminence-based medicine rather than evidence-based medicine. And that's the liberty I'm going to take even today. So who is the right patient for osteotomy? That's one question everybody has to ask. Conventionally, yes, 
unique compartment osteoarthritis of the knee, person with an active lifestyle, and those, even if they don't have active lifestyle, but they sit on the floor, for them, one procedure which is comfortable for them is high tibial osteotomy. We can extend the indications where it is more than unique compartment, particularly in our situation, our rural population. They may not be totally ideal candidate for STO, but because other things are not possible for them. So even STO can give them significant relief and there are papers on this. And it is basically their lifestyle requirement. They sit on the floor, you give them a TKR, they're done. Some people can't really afford, and not only in terms of money, but in terms of taking care of the uh, TKR, for example. I mean, you can't give a Mercedes car to a Juki dweller. You will actually do harm to him. So there are reasons which are extended reasons because that's the only thing that fits your patient. We have to talk about the patient who you're treating. Sometimes they're not, they're, they're living in rural areas and these extended indications have a role as far as osteotomy is concerned. Then of course, there are emerging indications which are more popular with you know arthroscopy sports medicine group in knee instability in cartilage surgery. I wouldn't go into this. So conventional indication, ideal indication and extended indication is my main area of interest today. Now, what do we want in a conventional patient for STO? We have to have a combination of these two things. One is medial compartment osteoarthritis and a varus alignment. So cause and effect relationship. If we break this Rahu Ketu, what I call, the patient improves. There has to be a medial compartment osteoarthritis, there has to be varus alignment. And if you correct the alignment, automatically you unload the compartment, the patient feels better. And that's the case where high tibial osteotomy is indicated. Question number one, how do you say that it is a unique compartment osteoarthritis? Because when a patient goes around in the market, one person says unique compartment, the TKR guy says this is all pen compartment. Now, is there a unique compartment osteo where you can confidently say yes, STO will work here. So my criteria is this, pain on the medial side, mostly on this side, medial side, I call it raccoon reka. If the pain is mostly on this side, most likely unique compartment. If I tell the patient, put your finger, and he puts the finger, my most of the pain is here, most likely the symptoms are coming from medial compartment. I do check patellofemoral compartment, particularly in our Indian population. And I think it is a thing that may not be so much uh, common abroad because people don't sit on the floor. So I have devised my own, what is called weight bearing simulation test. I ask the patient to bend the knee like this, and then I resist extension and keep my hand on the petla. I ask him to resist extension as if he's going up and down the stairs. If that causes pain, my antennas are on. This patient may be having part of the pain coming from petlofemoral joint. And even if I do an osteotomy, probably this will not be a happy patient. That's my own kind of way of doing it. So what is the pre-op workup that I do routinely? These are the set of x-rays. And I think merchant view is very, very critical. You don't want to miss a maltracking petla because you do a wonderful osteotomy for a varus deformity, but the pain is coming from petrofemoral joint. That is a failure. Another x-ray that I almost, almost always do now, and luckily it is available very freely, at least in uh, metro towns, is hip knee ankle x-ray. That gives me a lot of information. So what is the information? How much is the deformity? How bad is the deformity? What is the shifting of line of weight bearing? And then where is the deformity? I want to know whether it is the tibia, is the femur, and I'll come to that. Some of my colleagues living in little periphery asked me, what if we don't have HKA? Now, should we not do osteotomy? It is required for patients in interiors of India. So I tell them, okay, you can take a very strict AP of the femur and take AP of the tibia. And you can calculate the angles that I'm going to tell you, even those x-rays. You will miss out on joint line angle. Don't bother about it too much if there is no thrust. So there is a way out of HKA if that facility is not available to you. So there are clear unicompartment diseases like this. There's no doubt this cannot be pen compartment. It happened post menisectomy, osteonecrosis. And sometimes if you're doubtful about whether it is primarily a unicompartment disease, because you don't want to put your hand into a pen compartment disease, which will fail tomorrow after STO, you can get an MRI done. So sometimes x-ray is normal, everything looking good, but the patient is persistent. You can do an MRI and find if there are changes only in one compartment. 
particularly if they're enteromedia, they're more like isolated medial compartment arthritis. And these are the cases which you will confidence that you are probably not putting your hand into the wrong patient. So my checklist, medial compartment OA, yes, I've confirmed. Whereas malalignment, yes, I've confirmed either by visual or preferably by HKA and petlofemoral is normal and then osteotomy is indicated in my book. Where I would not do osteotomy, if it is a synovial disease, a lot of fluid in the joint, maybe bilateral knee effusion, I suspect there is something else happening. Predominantly petlofemoral symptoms, non-compliant patients, heavy smokers where osteotomy may cause difficulty in healing, flexion deformity more than 15 degrees, and if you can't really correct it, there's a big osteophyte at the back, this is from doing high table osteotomy. And also aristocratic lifestyle. Since I do all kind of knee surgery, I shift that patient to something like unicompartment. Why should I subject him to a prolonged rehab of STO, whereas he doesn't have to do much. He sits in the car, go to office. I think so we have to think about alternative procedures in those situations. Now, is whereas deformity equal to STO? That's the concept we used to have a few years back, but that's a wrong concept. And let me give you a little idea about how we should think. If we draw a hip knee ankle x-ray, these two angles, MLDFA lateral site and MPTA medial site. When you read the book, too many angles. I don't care about those angles. Just these two angles. And I remember the figure of 85. If it is more than 90 on this side, because it is supposed to be 85 to 90, it's abnormal. If it is less than 85 on this side, just remember two angles and two figures. If that is the case, you suspect a problem. Otherwise, sometimes I've got lost in the past in the maze of too many angles and too many you know, 85 oblique 90. I don't know what is correct. So these two figures have come to my mind to make my life easy. So let me show you some situations. So if this angle on the medial side, MPTA, is less than 85, as in this case, this is primarily a tibial deformity. On the other hand, if this is okay, but this angle is more than 95, as you can see here, then it is primarily a virus arising from femur. In this case, you cannot do high tibial osteotomy. You have to do a femoral osteotomy, as shown in this case. So this is something which is new in the sense it is last 10, 8, 10, 15 years. We have realized we cannot correct the deformity at the wrong place. And that is the importance of hip knee ankle x-ray that a lot of time, almost 30% of the time, we have a virus leg. Primarily, the deformity is in the femur and not in the tibia. And I can't do a healthy osteotomy in that patient. You have to do a femoral osteotomy. Now, sometimes it is both. And this becomes a little bit of a problem about whether you could do both or one. And there are details about where you should do both, where you should not do both. It's a big surgery if you do both, but sometimes it is required. But if you can do this x-ray, find out these angles, that can give you a guidance where you're going to do in tibia, in femur, or sometimes even both. Now, basically, whatever you do in osteotomy, it is a mechanical procedure. Like you have to understand the principle. What are you going to do? You are offloading the affected compartment. For example, if the line of weight bearing for the, going from the medial side, pain was on the medial side, just shift it to the lateral side somehow. Whatever way you do it, it's okay. As soon as you mechanically correct and understand the principle, it will work. While you're doing this, you should not change the tibial slope. That's something you have to keep an eye on. But that can have long-term implication in furthering the degeneration. And third, very important is you must look at the lateral view to see whether your petlofemoral is all right. Not clinically alone, but even on x-ray. For example, if there's a petla bar like this and you do open wedge, your correction may be perfect, wonderful, but the patient will have a petlofemoral pain, no use. He came with pain, he has gone out with pain. Now the question comes, which osteotomy should I do? There's so many of them. Close wedge, open wedge, dome osteotomy, and fixate assisted. In our huge, vast country, I know people, Kes Maheshwari in Jamnagar, who has done over a thousand of these and keeps doing it. And I've seen his results, wonderful. I've done dome osteotomy, I've seen Pranjal doing it and seen his results, wonderful. And for example, Dr. Pariyar, Mangal, Excellent. He, he shows uh, all of these guys actually swear by their technique and the results. I, of course, do open wedge and I will come to you. So there are pros and cons. And let me tell my colleagues who may be watching, all techniques are good enough if you know the principle and you can carry forward. So there's n number of studies for closed wedge osteotomy lasting for 
15, 20 years, you have to just understand what are you going to do and how you will do it well. So any of these techniques can give you equally good results. They're a little bit plus minuses, but do what suits you. As long as you understand, there's no sacrosanct about doing high tibial osteotomy by tomofix. It's not really necessary because there are issues with every technique. Is arthroscopy necessary prior to STO? I, as a surgeon, whenever I do any reconstructive surgery on the knee, I always want to look inside the joint. It's like I have the hammer, so I want to hit the nail because I want to see what's happening inside. That takes me 10 minutes. But actually, it's not necessary for STO. You can do away without uh, with, uh, with arthroscopy. Now, modern day osteotomy is obviously considered open wedge osteotomy. And there have been a lot of literature. What is the pros and cons of closed wedge? The, you know, the complication, this, that. I would not go into the detail of it. But open wedge is also of two types, uniplanar and biplanar. And that's where the complexity of osteotomy is getting in today, which is really frightening the people. So what is uniplanar? Just make a medial cut, open it up, do whatever, put something inside, and the correction is done. And one of my colleagues, very senior colleague in Delhi, he does it in 15 minutes. He puts a wedge inside, puts the patient in plaster. And very good results again. He understands what he's doing. Though he is not using any plate, nothing, but he's correcting the alignment. It's a simple osteotomy. He's putting the patient in plaster. This patient doesn't mind a plaster. Good enough. Good principle and good result with a simple surgery. On the other hand, we have biplanar osteotomy as promoted by uh, AO group. Now, what is the advantage of biplanar osteotomy? So first of all, it is a combination of two osteotomies. One goes from medial to lateral like this in this plane, and another one in this plane, coronal and sagittal plane. And advantage it gives is that there is a good context, a stable osteotomy. So I would not go into the details, but it is a little modification on this osteotomy, which is a little open wedge only, whereas this is not only open wedge, biplanar, and gives a few more advantages. I cannot go into the detail of that at this moment. Now, once there is a gap in open wedge, again, if we have been taught in orthopedics, if there is a gap, this flexor will not heal. And here we are creating a gap and still it is healing. How it is healing? Less than 12 millimeter of gap, no graft is required, just fills up. That area is fantastic. If it is more than 10 millimeter, it is plus minus. A lot of people do not put graft even in 15 to 20 millimeter opening, but I would suggest it's a safe way to do and you should put some kind of a graft there. And if it is, you, you can use even synthetic wedges, which gives stability as well as some osteoconduction. So graft filling is very individual. I fill my graft if more than 15 millimeter. Now, when we come to fixation for STO, there are so many of them in the market, Udu's plate. You can use any medial plate, simple AO plate. Put This is my own case done 15 years back. And I actually put bone cement there just to make it stable. And it healed up, it did, did very well. And simple plate, very stable osteotomy, very good correction for this and worked for almost 20 years. This was done 15 years back, now 15 years. And then, of course, now Tomofix is there, which is a very standard technique. Now, what is my preferred technique? I do open wedge osteotomy with Tomofix. Why do I do it? I can dial in correction on table. Open wedge osteotomy has this advantage. Then when you're doing it, you can open, 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 more, 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 and be very sure that you've got the right correction, which is not the case in my hand in closed wedge. It decides itself. Whatever wedge you may remove, but once you close the wedge, it goes wherever it wants to go. So I'm not very happy with that. It is a biplanar osteotomy, which makes it stable. It, it makes healing better. That's why I do biplanar osteotomy. Fixation with angle stable is very, very solid. And you can actually do early weight bearing. And my patients walk within three days, four days, weight bearing as tolerated on this, this surgery when I do unilateral. And of course, I do quite a few bilateral same sitting. I make them walk within a month of surgery, a big saving on a condition which is bilateral. Otherwise, you do one and do another one. After six months, it's a headache. Now, some experience-based tip. I must give some of my own tips to people. Now, after a long of struggling, a lot of struggling, I've started doing this osteotomy without tunique because I want to see the whole leg. I use my eyeballing all the time. I've been fooled by every other technique possible for getting a good alignment on the table. So I expose everything. It's a simple incision here, some bleeding initially. After that, nothing happens. So I don't use a tunique. I have the whole limb aligned or almost naked in front of me. I protect posterior structures very carefully. I have a spatial curved uh, osteotome which goes behind slowly. That's one thing I cannot mess up with. 
gradual opening of the osteotomy open wedge and that is the principle of doing the open wedge osteotomy particularly using the biplanar osteotomy where the key is to keep this hinge intact that's what the osteotomy heals up very fast and with bipolar biplanar it heals up here also so that is the advantage that you can take liberty of early weight bearing if you have not really completed the osteotomy through and through now on table assessment of correction is very critical you can use whatever method i think i i'll come to this there are two three method i use all three of them on the table i always do a post op ct scanogram next morning like this and if you can see i use two long boards and two short boards at least in three or four occasions i had to go in again because my correction on the table despite my best effort wasn't okay so i went next morning just remove these four boards corrected it further and made this board longer so i use this caveat to not put all the four boards through and through in case next morning i don't find my correction is adequate so you are doing this surgery for adequate correction by any chance if that correction is not achieved that surgery fails so i don't hesitate in doing a scanogram and at least on a few occasions i have gone back embarrassing enough for me and the patient for me more than the patient but i took the patient again and did the job now there are some intra op decision making so we know calculations of mnc you can do that i've done quite a few of them at the at the end on the table i don't know what happens all those calculation go for a six then you can do intra op here and very good but you must be sure that your image can fool a little tilted image here and there little rotation of the leg can shift this line here and there so really not very very uh, effective in my hands i lately i have started using a fixator on the lateral side this is not the right picture and i correct it and then take a proper hip knee ankle x ray like this and then put a plate on the medial side what are the complications insufficient correction can happen loss of correction can happen if your fixation is not okay it can progress if the arthritis is actually so called pan arthritis non union delayed union can happen if you are there are factors like that infection can happen everywhere and there are implant related complication because it is subcutaneous plate it does cause problem and almost 20 to 30% patients ask for removal of that plate there are some recent developments and this is the latest paper that we have published which is bilateral osteotomy in the same city then i did try computer navigation in the middle but i think it was too messy i gave up now we have peak plates so you can't see the plate here and it is very friendly on the patient probably removal is not required and last patient specific jigs with that i thank you for your attention thank you dr uh, jitendra that was a very precise uh, lecture uh, you said uh, you said you are not uh, doing arthroscopy as most of the arthroscopists will do before before the osteotomy do you do advocate mri in all cases no no mri in all cases if it is clinically a medial compartment arthritis with a varus deformity i have to be sure that the pain is coming from medial side that's all <clears throat> now once i offload that whether there is a meniscus tear or not whether there is a cartilage injury there or not it doesn't bother me because i have offloaded that area but as i told you i do arthroscopy in all cases but it is not a must in the literature as well as people who don't do arthroscopy they should not think that it is a must to do arthroscopy before as you it's not you rightly said about the eyeballing and sometimes uh, the correction is not good how can we what are the tips to avoid this mistakes i think you have to use all the three methods you have to calculate your wedge you have to create that wedge you have to use a cautery rod or whatever rod on the table and lately i have in last two cases i have actually used a fixator because when you are trying to correct it and correct, sometimes you actually correct at the joint level you push and pull so it should be a static correction of achieved on the table before you start fixing with the plate what is the maximum varus you have corrected and uh, how do you go about it uh, single or uh, double osteotomy meaning femur and tibia yeah so I've, i i am not a big fan of doing double osteotomy honestly speaking and i am learning this i'm i'm getting there but i think it's too much of surgery i know as a as a as a engineer as a german surgeon it will give me a lot of kick to put every millimeter right but i really don't know it was never talked nobody talked about this in the literature done 30 years back and there were follow up of 20 years so to my mind i i would weigh between the quantum of surgery and the benefit that surgery is giving 
Uh, so I've done only two cases in last so many years, but but I agree the concept that if you want to get it right and put it biomechanically correct, you should be bold enough sometimes to do even femoral osteo. If I can make a comment on that, if it is for osteoarthritis, usually one one level suffices. If it's for OANE, the problem is when we are doing it for other causes and the deformity is quite severe. And these are the times then you may require in younger patients a double osteo. But for OA, almost never, I have never done a double level. So it's always at the tibia. Right. My story, sir, there is a small question. As because you are not doing, because I do arthroscopy before doing the HDO. Uh, do you, uh, in your pre-op protocol, do you do, do the stress X-ray uh, single leg or the varus valgus stress test so that you know that the lateral joint uh, is the intact? Because that is mandatory for planning of if you are not doing the arthroscopy, you have to see that the lateral joint space is still intact. Do you do that? Well, theoretically, what you are saying sounds logical. But let me tell you, I have gone away from that even in my uni compartments. Okay? And I have opened up all these so much horrific, horrific looking uh, knee arthritis where I do TKR. So often, I find lateral compartment is normal. I think it is an overblown thing to be sure that lateral compartment is... After all, we are not shifting it all the way to lateral. We are only a little bit midline lateral. So even if there is a little theoretical possibility of early lateral arthritis, I don't think I'm going to make it worse. I used to do it earlier, but I honestly speaking, I've given up. I don't even do. Like even arthroscopy, I do more of a matter of habit. And I generally feel it is not required. I used to do arthroscopy before unique compartment almost 100% times. I don't do it now because I don't find anything. Uh, so my clinical impression of medial compartment pain Whereas deformity, offload the medial compartment. That's my philosophy in this surgery. Okay, now we go to the... Just one minute. So Milin sir is waiting for long. Yeah. Uh, Mahishwari sir, a wonderful presentation and real practical tips uh, for that matter. You have put it very nicely in a nutshell. The only thing is now people are talking about uh, associated root tears with uh, high tibial osteotomy. So there is actually a confusing evidence as well that if you do an offloading osteotomy, it is found that the root lesions, they heal on themselves. Although the principle of surgery is to offload the medial compartment, but if there is a medial meniscus or root tear, which makes the meniscus defunct, and it is not complete offloading of the medial compartment, then with a root tear, there will be ongoing degeneration of the medial compartment. It is not that we are offloading complete medial compartment, right? So, uh, have you have you ever thought of this and uh, have you repaired uh, roots along with uh, medial open wedge? So, uh, I have burnt my finger with root repairs. Okay, so I've done root repair alone. Very often with the various deformity, that has not worked. I've done root, I've done only osteotomies. In ignored root repair, it, it worked. The best, to my mind, technical, technical environment is more important than any repair. You can repair anything if you do not correct the biomechanics, which was the cause of that problem to start with, in all probability. I don't think you, you will get the result. No, sir. My question was, yeah. if you have a root tear along with a varus deformity, you have planned a medial open wedge high tibial osteotomy, and you're ignoring the root uh, tear, so then there will be ongoing medial compartment OA because the meniscus is defunct now. But yes, so I know by you. not doing, no, by yeah. not doing. So Milind, uh, if yeah. I may just, uh, in, yeah. uh, just make a comment. Uh, yeah, uh, excellent sure talk, Dr. Maheshwari. So I completely agree, Milind. And the, there is a Korean paper which is showing that, you know, they don't do root repairs with HTO. And I also don't do it with, if I do an HTO, I don't do a root repair. And the logic is, that the contraindication for a root repair is a malalignment more than five degrees. And that is actually an indication for an HTO. So, you know, you, right. you as uh, Dr. Maheshwari said, you know, like a German surgeon, you want to fix every part. But are you making a difference? So, you know, we may be able to fix the root along with an HTO, but is it really going to help? Or you, what your question is, is it going to harm? Well, only time will tell, but currently the jury is out, as you rightly said. There are two schools of thought. Uh, can I add something to this? Uh, I believe also there are reports where they have uh, done the root repair and osteotomy and when we are trying to remove the plate, 
they have found out that root has not killed yeah so so that's what it's on uh, both the sides yeah. but uh, uh, theoretically speaking if you say that then you are not completely offloading the medial compartment so ashray yeah. has rightly put uh, uh, put forth that there are two schools of thoughts you can do it either way so i think maheshwari sir's way is not to do it uh, uh, given a choice i would definitely like to fix the root and correct the mal alignment so that uh, develops a conducive atmosphere for the root to heal so then do you fix it with an anchor or do you use that uh, anterior cortex button no i i do it with a pull, uh, pull out suture okay. uh, transtibial so okay. the only thing okay. is you have to take care of a little bit of your osteotomy site and uh, not to coil it okay can Please we go to the uh, next speaker now looking for uh, the root repair can we go to the next speaker because we are uh, yes sir overshooting the time Uh, I now call upon Dr. Ayappan Nair, who was a former associate professor of Amrita Institute, Kochi. Now he is a consultant surgeon surgeon in Manipal Hospital, Whitefield, Bangalore. He has done a lot of fellowships uh, in shoulder surgery in Korea and Japan. And the uh, best thing is he has worked with the master, uh, who has the pioneer, who has initiated the. Uh, the reconstruction of the defect in uh, irretractable uh, and massive rotator cuff tear with a superior capsular repair procedure uh, dr over to you dr ayapan nair thank you so much sir uh, good morning to all uh, most respected uh, senior faculty uh, teachers and the colleagues i'm extremely privileged for this opportunity and uh, especially with the stalwarts of uh, arthroscopy and orthopedics Special thanks to MOA BOS and uh, special thanks to my friend Dr. Sandeep Pirades for this opportunity. So I'll be speaking on the superior capsula reconstruction. So um, this was a technique devised by Dr. Mihata, and um, he he this was a this technique of his was a game changer in our understanding and in our repair of irreparable rotator cuff uh, tears. So. this uh, technique is based on the advances in anatomy which we know now about the rotator cuff and the capsule so now we know that the supraspinatus has got a very small attachment area compared to the infraspinatus and we also know that in 21% of cases we have an we have an attachment of the supraspinatus to the lt as well so this is again another picture showing a very small attachment to supraspinatus we also understand that the capsule is very important and the capsular attachment is very thick and uh, quite um, wide on the gt we also know that along with rotator cuff tears massive rotator cuff tears um, we have capsular tears as well and we also know biomechanically capsule is very important for stability with all this in mind we come to the uh, talk on we come to the concept of irreparable tear we call a tear irreparable when arthroscopically or otherwise we are not able to approximate uh, the cuff to the gt with a with without any tension there are several reasons why a tear can be irreparable it could be because of the chronicity of the tear and severe retraction in elasticity muscle atrophy and fatty infiltration so there is few things which we should consider when we actually look at a tear especially if we feel that the tear is little chronic one is the fatty infiltration so if you look at the sag views we can what we can see is you can see the scapula y and here we can see the uh, rotator cuff and here we have to look at the fat amount of fatty infiltration if the fatty infiltration is more like stage 3 and 4 that means it is it could be irreparable and also that the outcome of such a repair surgery would not be great and we could have retage as well then another consideration is we have to look at once we decide we have to know uh this and the kind of surgery we have to know is there any uh, is there any glenohumeral arthritis how much of the head is actually gone up so this particular grading by hamada hamada grading is quite helpful for us hamada grade 1 starts with a uh, very less reduction in acromohumeral distance hd is very slightly reduced grade 2 goes to a less than that is hd comes to less than 5 mm and then grade 3 we called as acetabulization that means there's a severe reduction and there is rubbing of bones here gt against the acromia grade 4 involves glenohumeral arthritis and grade 5 involves actually collapse and osteonecrosis so grade 4 and grade 5 are quite not conducive to reconstruction procedures because even if we do a reconstruction patient continues to have significant arthritis and pain 
Then another consideration is whenever you see a cuff, when you look at the MRI, we would like to see what is the amount of retraction. Now, this is the stage by modified pate method. This stage one, two, and three. Stage three is quite bad. That means it will be very difficult to bring it back to its position. It looks like very much retracted. This should be this modified pate technique should be we should take two cuts, uh, two cuts adjoining cuts in the coronal. And so considering all this, we will, so we have, we are left with basically two choices to preserve the joint. And if the, suppose the patient is above 60 years and if he is in Hamada grade four and five, that is severe arthritis is there or glenohumeral arthritis is there. Definitely we can go in for a reverse shoulder replacement. And at the same time, the patient is younger and we don't have um, much, we don't have arthritis or glenohumeral arthritis is not there. Then we can go in for joint preservation. So the options in front of us are a patch graft surgery, where you basically patch the graft, the defect. We can do muscle transfers like an LT transfer. We can do partial repairs, partial repairs like this. And we can do a repair with augmentation. We can cut the biceps, shift it over and cover the defect. And we can also do something called as biceps rerouting. This is a nice technique by which we uh, re uh, remove the bicep from its normal groove, shift a little more posteriorly and attach the remaining cuff along with it. So this is another technique and all these have its side, uh, his problems, the sets of problems are there. So the most important problem in a patch graft surgery would be a retear. So this is where we have the superior capsular reconstruction. So here it is based on this particular paper in 2012 AJSM that uh, Dr. Mihata did a biomechanical study. And what he did was he did a, he made a massive rotator cuff tear and he he did a capsular reconstruction. He took a facial latter graft, attached one end here and one end here. So he did a nice coverage. And what he noticed was there is definitely biomechanically is much more stable and there is a decreased subacromial contact pressure. The AHD or the acromohumal distance increased and the glenohumal compression pressures also came back to normal. So then he, 2015, he came out with a uh, paper 72 shoulders. Hamada grade one to three, that means there's no glenohumeral arthritis. And uh, he, again, he replicated the same technique. What he did was he measured the defect and he put in a facial atta, uh, doubled or a triple graft, uh, which was around six to 10 millimeter thick. So excellent results he had. And he showed that his, the patient's range improved quite nicely. And also the scoring also was great. And his retails was quite less. Some of the patients even went back to uh, lifting heavy weights and some of them were like even head load, head load workers in this particular papers. So now uh, I would I'd like to present one or two cases, each in a different scenario. So we had a 56 year old female patient who came with history of fall seven months back. On examination, she had pseudo paralysis, the flexion was of 30 degrees, abduction 30 degrees actively and dropper was positive. The MRI showed a uh, increase in uh, decrease in acromohumal distance a proximal migration was there. We can see the amount of retraction, a severe retraction to supraspinate at this level up to the beyond the glenoid level. And uh, this is another picture of the MR. And the, we did the same technique uh, pres uh, prescribed by Dr. Mihata. So what he did was uh, we did a debridement, found out how much the defect was. And this is how the defect was debrided. And the next step was to put a we put two anchors that is glenoid anchors that is above the labrum above the labrum two double loaded or single loaded anchors were put and uh, we put a middle row anchors here two that is anterior and posterior middle row anchors here at this particular point i use triple loaded anchors i don't usually use the um, uh, speed bridge which is uh, by arthrex so this even though this picture is from arthrex website so here i use triple loaded anchors and after i do that i take the measurement i measure the defect once i know the defect that medial lateral and anterior posterior what the defect is then i can calculate what is the graft size which is required so the graft is pushed in this way and we shuttle the graft in and finally it is fixed by a, here it is by a speed bridge but sometimes i i always use a, a, a suture bridge technique and the last part of the surgery would be uh, we have to do something called as side-to-side -side repairs where the graft is actually stitched along with the remnant of the cuff. So here, this is a graft which is taken out and we double the graft and this is the process by which the graft is taken in. 
So normally, till the point of graft entry or graft shuttling, we can use regular atomum uh, atomum uh, cannulas. But since the graft is quite big, we have to use uh, um, a syringe, 20 cc syringe, which we cut on either side, and it's also slotted, and then we can shuttle it in. And this is the final picture here. This patient went on to have uh, excellent results. So this is the recovery process. So for the first six weeks, I completely immobilized it. And uh, after that, we started with passive and then gradually active assisted. And this is at 12 weeks. You can see her range at 12 weeks. So she went on to achieve um, a nice uh, range. She's holding it well. But the only problem in this particular patient was, I, what we found was, okay, the power is never perfect. The power is only four by five. And uh, she went back to a normal life. But even after six months of therapy, we never got full power. So this is another interesting case, a different scenario altogether. Here, what happened was, uh, this is a 68-year-old lady. Uh, the primary cuff repair was done elsewhere. She had a fall again, came with a recurrent tear. The MRI showed a full tear, a retraction up to the glenoid. Severe fatty infiltration. This is the rich. So, and the, so we did a diagnostic arthroscopy. So, so this is a diagnostic arthroscopy and uh, I'm just trying to mobilize the cuff. The remaining anchor and uh, thread's been taken off. So the, prox the upper superior portion of the labrum and has been taken off and I'm preparing a glenoid there. So trying to mobilize the cuff. So I actually mobilize the cuff by elevating the glenoid as well as um, above the cuff. And then with the bird, I'm preparing the tissue there. So I'm, so I'm hoping for real graft healing. And then I'm just taking a shaman. So, and next step is the glenoid anchor placement. Here, I'm putting the anterior anchor sheet with double anchor here. And once the glenoid anchor is a place, we can meet from the stump. And then we can do the measurement. We can measure what is the size of the effect. So the size of the graft would should be five millimeters extra on each side. And this is the middle load. And, and after the middle load is put up, just manual measurement for a to that. I keep the open and just the radio and then go in and take the graph. So middle road. It is done and then I have the graph. Here this is the lateral thigh at the vertical incision 10 centimeter long. The facial lateral is taken. And I, on an average, uh, take at least around more than six millimeter, because the thicker the graft is better, but the minimum size would be a six millimeters. So six millimeter we can easily achieve by doubling. And there's a technique by which, okay, if you can take a little part of the insertion point of the G max, that would be the thickest part of the facial ladder, and that would actually help us better. So then coming to the last part, the lateral row anchor. So once I've done this, I have shuttled and put the graft inside. Then I shuttle the remaining part of my triple loaded uh, sutures into the remaining cuff and I have the complete repair. And here the last part is, and the most important, the most important part is to do uh, side to side repair. So side to side repair is very important. So we have to pass it from the remnant cuff into the graft, at least two passes and a night uh, and nice closure is required because it is very important for healing as well as the mechanics for it to move normally. So this is at post up four months. The patient is going to have a full range, but again, the same problem we faced this particular patient also, the power never came back to normal. It was just four by five power, but she was painless. So that's a, so this is the final result at six months. Again, at the end of six months, no pain, range is full, and uh, power is just four by five. This is a completely a slightly more different scenario. A 59-year-old male patient, and he came with a history of pain. A history of fall was there, history of pain in the shoulder, not uh, responding to physiotherapy. On examination, he had full range of movement. His full can was positive, empty can was positive, and brain was positive. But still, his range was good. We can see that he's got a good range, but this was associated with pain, and he had a power loss. Power was 4 by 5. 
So then here again, full range. But the interesting thing in the MRI was he had a proximal migration, a decrease in the AHD, and there was a cuff tear at supraspinatus retracted up to the glenoid here. But we can see that infraspinatus is actually coming till here. So that means it could be a huge U-shaped tear. And if fat infiltration was two or three, and this is what we did. So we did a uh, diagnostic arthroscopy. Here I did the surgery slightly differently. Here what I did was I decided to use the biceps also as an augmentation. So we can see uh, uh, that the head is completely bald. And this is the cuff tissue. And that's a cuff tissue. And this is the acromion, acromion space. And this is the biceps. So I did a debridement check for the biceps root. I so just to see that how good the biceps was. And then uh, the next step was once I cleared up, I started doing a debridement, uh, prepared the GT, and then I start going for the cuff isolation. So cuff isolation, the same technique, that means we have to mobilize it uh, above the labrum, superior labrum, as well as above the cuff, the bursal tissue, and nicely mobilize it. This is the labrum here, superior labrum, and here we can go up to almost two centimeter to mobilize it. And when that is done, I mobilize the cuff. I try to pull the cuff and see how much it is coming. I can see that the anterior most of the cuff is coming as well as the infraspinatus pad part is also coming. But in the middle, middle of the GT area, it is not being mobilized at all. So here I'm preparing the biceps. Here the biceps has been cut. I mobilize the biceps and do a biceps anatomy. And I do a rerouting procedure. So there are the biceps been cut. And I shift the biceps. And this is um, then when the biceps been released, these are trans we need traction switches to mobilize nicely. And this is the final part of the release and mobilization. And the third in particular the coming so the glenoid as and after the glenoid anchors but we do the biceps anchors then um so anchors basically you fill the anchor gives you lot of I can mobilize the I can use uh, one stand for the in the books so in the number here again same technique so I double the graph and then I do before the graph is passed I do something as a we do a shuttling. And this this is put it from the cuff. Take the cuff here is the cuff. So that be excellent mobilization of the cuff. So I can have this cuff to that integrate. So what I'm doing here. I once I done that, then I go in for a uh, radium ready for a graft passage. So graft is passed like this again using a 26 syringe. And once it is passed, so now I pass the graft and I have a look here already passed it and kept it ready. Now here again the lower anchor what I do is I take multiple passes through the remnant infraspinatus. This is the glenoid stitches putting in the glenoid stitches. On top of the cuff, you can see the uh, suture being there. Once I've filled, I put it there. And these are the final passes through the remnant cuff, this area, infraspinatus passes. So I've got a nice coverage, not only of the, of the graft, but also I've taken the remaining cuff. And next step would be, I would do a crisscross suture bridge technique. So the suture bridge, uh, gives me an excellent coverage. We can see the lateral row anchors coming. Now you can see a nice coverage. That's a graft. It's a beautiful graft. And we can see the remnant tissue as well. There's a nice overlap between both. And there's a nice coverage. There's no gapping at all. So these are two lateral row anchors. There's beautiful coverage there. And the last step would be to do a side to side. So again, I do a side to side uh, using an 18 gauge spinal needle. 
and an excellent uh, we do a nice coverage so it should be a very a good integration we can see that this part is the graft and uh, this little more red tissue would be the remaining cup so here he had 6 months he recovered to full range there's no pain then he got full power so that is full range at 6 months he's absolutely painless back to his normal activities and we have we can have other, have other modified techniques also which is not a pure uh, biceps uh, sorry uh, scr in this particular technique here what i've done is instead of doing a facial atta graft i have done a bicep rerouting so what i've done is i made a new i cut the biceps at a group made a new trough for it i made a new trough here this is a biceps and i shifted the biceps you can see the biceps here that's a remnant cuff so here what i i make a new trough for it and i shift the biceps here once i shift the biceps here then i suture the remaining cuff through the biceps otherwise the my choice in this patient i could have done a partial repair which i don't want to do this is how the biceps uh, we suture the biceps and i pass the each thread through the biceps into the cuff it was like and then through the supraspinatus and the infraspinatus so we get a nice coverage this is called as bicep rerouting it's not a, not a pure scr but that's we had excellent results so now uh, dr mihata has gone on to do more papers so he he here in this particular paper he says that side to side repair is very very important for stability and we have uh, papers from other authors like this one one year follow up excellent power range and uh, the increase in the hd and the superior uh, capsular distance as well again we have even latest paper 2017 2019 papers are coming out with excellent results so overall i feel that it is a excellent technique which helps in joint preservation of the shoulder and um, if we keep uh, the complications in mind like you know we should not be doing on a severely arthritic patient then definitely it will give us excellent results thank you doctor uh, i have fun for a fantastic lecture also a very very excellent video demonstration of your techniques and the newer insights into the uh, into the surgery of superior capsular repair and covering up the defect because of the uh, torn rotator cuffs uh, now questions how uh, since you have the opportunity to work with the master which we have not had how do you adjust the tension on the graft on the graft and uh, avoid the excessive pull out on the graft and what happens to the graft in the long range okay sir sir uh, uh, the first part of the question like um, uh, how to handle the graft without tension so there are two things we do once we that uh, once we have to use a syringe and the syringe side of the syringe should be the, the front end of the syringe should be cut and then we slot it so advantage is that it we can actually crimp it crimp it rather and push it into the through the deltoid and once we do that we should not entirely depend on the shuttling of the sutures we should literally hold the uh, cuff uh, that means a graft with a, a suture a, a suture retriever or a grasper and literally push it inside so that will help us Uh, you know take the graft in very very safely so like another thing we can do is uh, we take us uh, another shuttling suture from the end of the graft and pass it inside and take it to the anterior port that also helps in mobilizing the graft in without tensions so basically the most important thing to avoid a pull out is that we have to literally hold it grasp it and push it inside so that way we don't uh, uh, the tension is not there and we it can uh, um, aram se pass inside No, what i mean is tension while suturing so suturing there is not much tension at all because we have an excellent coverage because we have a 5 mm overhang on 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 the uh, on the medial side on the gt side we have a almost 1 cm overhang so there is no tension at all in the graph there sir and uh, um yeah what happens to the graft in the long run does it become like a yes, tendon sir. or yeah. Yes, sir. So I, I had, uh, I interestingly, I also uh, asked Dr. Mihata the same question. So he says it all integrates. So he is, uh, he has done repeat MRI, is long term MRI, which shows that integrates. 
then dr sugaya has come out with a very very interesting paper on mri healing of this uh, graft so there are four grades according to him so grade one is like if it is a uh, very homogeneous and uh, but um, uh, low echogenicity but uh, next is high grade echogenicity and then there is partial tear and full tears so if it heals it has to in an mri it has to appear almost like a normal cuff with continuity and low echogenicity i mean i mean uh, low low signal intensity so it apparently it heals according to him and is dr sugai also believes the same dr sundaran and ask a question about side to side repair can you highlight Sir. on that sir so once we have passed the graft inside so now we it is very important that we uh, have a nice uh, you know a suture going from the cuff to the graft and we should at least do at least one or two minimum in the minimum two or even more three is also better this will ex- the two advantages for this is because blood supply healing uh, fibrosis integration and second is also biomechanically moving it so when uh, the suppressed magnetus is moving the remnant of the supra or the infra is moving there is an adjoining movement in the capsule in the in the in the graft also so what i have done is i went in one of my patients especially the uh, the last patient what i did was i did an emg study i did dn d did an emg at the end of 6 months i have compared his emg activation potential on both on both sides that is the normal side as well as this i found the emg was quite good and it was normal on both sides that means to say that it is actually integrating well side to side repair i think it really helps in that dr antav can i ask yeah. a question please yes please. yes so two things i have been firstly congratulations on your work uh, the first thing is that if you if you read these papers and especially dr burkart's work it says that this operation does not restore power it only allows you to get that forward flexion range of motion so i don't think power would be really necessary and the second thing is that the other criticism of using a fascia lata and i know you know we are uh, stuck for resources in india we don't have an artificial graft Uh, but the problem with fcr is that it is a stiff graft and i don't know of any results from other centers who have replicated the same outcome as mihata has so what are your thoughts having personally visited him or you know what can be done to make this uh, better with a cheaper resource yeah so uh, about this um, uh, graft the facial at a graft so i believe that uh, i think we should compare this to as the spacer so no if even if it is not we are not talking about graph integration and all that if we should have the spacer effect i think the facial letter gives gives us an excellent spacer to have a very thick graph there uh, at the same time if we compare to an arthritis patch which is available earlier so that is one thing i always thought that yeah definitely if the deltoid has to work and the mechanics has to be restored even if the remaining cuff is not working well it is important to have a nice spacer i feel that the facial letter gives us a nice spacer effect then about um, about um, other centers dr sugaya his uh, has an excellent result in 2019 uh, there is one more paper from japan uh, which talks about 35 cases using a facial atta graft same technique so he, out of 35 he had the seven retires but uh, uh, he other many patient did extremely well and uh, then talking about the power i uh, i had a severe i mean i had a great deal of problem because these patients especially if it is a lady patient and who doesn't have a inherent power in the deltoid we find it very difficult to rehab them and get a uh, nice power at the same time if it is a male patient with a inherent power power is there deltoid is muscle strength is good then it definitely helps uh, that's what uh, i think on um, uh, the same and a very most important thing was mihata believes that in his paper he talks about uh, weight lifters so we don't have that kind of experience but he believes that the power can come but in none of my patients except for the last one where he uh, even uh, because preoperatively he had a full range only that patient recovered to full power so to add on to this question and the last question uh, what is it it relieves the pain or gives the power because most of the studies say the healing of the graft is about 45 to 50% yes yeah, sir yeah i said sir in all our patients we are getting uh, because from pseudo paralysis we are going to full range definitely we are getting a power up to 4 by 5 and uh, uh, the pain scores definitely improve all these patients are painless 
so that is the best part of it so we are getting a full range with less power and uh, full range yes sir anta sir can and i make a comment yes yes please yeah so uh, i have uh, i take uh, shreyas's uh, uh, question ahead although i have not worked with miyata but i had a uh, uh, an occasion to assist him uh, doing a scr uh, in mumbai and, and i got privilege to speak to him for about uh, half an hour 45 minutes the problem is miyata's indication that different that is why his results are so miyata yes. doesn't believe in partial so whatever cases he does where the supraine infra for a surgeon like you and me we would do a partial cuff repair with almost the same results so when supraine infra are intact he doesn't believe in releases so posterior release is gone but at least you can do anterior and supraglenoid release and add a biceps scr to it to get the similar results so miyata believes that cuff it is an indication for scr so in such all situations the supraine infra and to do a active duct is what professor eppen wants to say in weight lifters whereas the indications of scr what we are looking at there is just a thin flimsy infra which is left and incorporating that into a fascia lata also would not recruit infra spinatus so basically after scr we believe on anterior deltoid so we just the biceps yes. or a spacer has got a depressor effect which acts right. which makes deltoid to act in functional way and that is the way how they come we have seen that in our routine cuff patients also we don't get 4 by 5 most of the times you just get 3 by 5 where you have uh, really nicely repaired a, a cuff so uh, I, i think power you, you cannot get painless shoulder yes it acts as a spacer you believe on a anterior deltoid and indications of miyata are different that is when nobody can replicate the results okay thanks william yeah thank you useful. yeah good. thank you can we go on to the next speaker now uh we have dr p gopinathan uh who is a professor of orthopedics uh and uh, he is a journal uh, editor chief editor of the journal of orthopedics uh he is going to talk to us on arthroscopic bicep tenodesis dr gopinathan थैंक यू anyway your sound is cracking also there is echo echo there is echo and also your sound is cracking uh, sir uh, we will go ahead with the next talk he will connect with the computer okay i think until the next talk so that yeah. so that he can okay. all right uh, we uh, uh we allow dr bhopinathan to look after his mbn whatever technical difficulty he has right now to save time call upon dr uh, uh, my co moderator dr milin pimpriker uh, who is a big name in arthroscopy and joint surgeries and uh, always there for all the webinars and uh, what uh, i like about him is he will give very succinct remarks uh, he is uh, now going into spirituality lectures i love that milan and also he is also besides being uh, 
besides being an orthopedic surgeon, he has degree in sports medicine and also degree in journalism. Uh, Milind, excellent. Uh, please talk about uh, arthroscopic Hargland syndrome and uh, osteogonum uh, arthroscopic excision. Please share your screen, sir. It is always nice to have Milind with us. Milind is a nice guy and he's too good. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yeah, so uh, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity, uh, organizers and all esteemed and senior faculty uh, to listen to this talk. Actually, uh, the second talk, which was on, uh, uh, which was on Ostrigonum, I could not get the post-op pictures of the patient, so I have added uh, another case to it. I so, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so the patient, because of lockdown, could not come back for the pictures to be taken. So I've put another case. So the topic for the day is uh, Hagelin's bump, or uh, which is also called as insertional tendinopathy. The incidence and classification of all Achilles tendon uh, uh, pathologies if you see, they are classified into three. These are insertional, pre-insertional, uh, which is also called as retrocalcaneal bursitis. And you also have a superficial calcaneal bursitis. So 25% of all Achilles tendon pathologies are because of uh, these uh, uh, diseases. The pre-insertional one, classically called as Hagelin's exhaustosis, the Hagelin's disease and the other conditions as the superficial Achilles bursitis, they are different in terms of causes, histopathology, and prognosis. And that is the reason why all Achilles tendon pathologies are classified into pre-insertional, insertional, insertional uh, tendinopathies. The clinical assessment is characterized in Haglund's by pain and tenderness, which is marked over the posterior superior side of the calcaneus, where there is a calcaneal prominence, which is often felt. And that is the classical kind of a Hagelin's bump, which is also called as pump bump. And uh, that is the cause of pain into the posterior superior area of calcaneum. Insertional uh, Achilles pathologies is located at the insertion of the tendo Achilles onto the calcaneum. And it is often associated with formation of a bony spur there. So you have two different pathologies, a superficial calcaneal spur and a Hagelin's bump. And this could give rise to calcification at the insertion site. It was Muffoli, which we had on one of the webinars who coined the term tendinopathy uh, for all these collective uh, uh, pathologies at the heel. Now, the endoscopic calcaneoplasty was paid attention to uh, by none other than uh, Nick Van Dyck. And this is the original picture from Nick Van Dyck article, which he had published uh, in 1997. So actually, you can see that that is a tendo Achilles coming. This is the posterior superior bump. This is the calcaneum. This is a superficial uh, uh, calcific deposit, which happens at the insertion of the tendo Achilles. And it is the retrocalcaneal bursa. So there is an impingement because of the bump onto the retrocalcaneal bursa, giving rise to inflammation of the retrocalcaneal bursa, and then the Hagelin's bump. Sometimes, as, I, as you, we just saw in the last slide, you have this intratendon calcification, which is at the superficial attachment of the tendo Achilles, and it is not at the posterior superior bump, which is classically a Hagelin's bump. If you get the MRI done in these cases, which actually I don't do whenever I operate on these patients, but if you see a MRI, a classical picture would be a tendo Achilles getting inserted, this is the superficial insertion onto the calcaneum. You get a lot of bone edema at the Hagelin's bump here in very active cases. And you will have all those hyperintense shadows, which will, give, uh, which will give you an impression of a fluid or uh, inflammation into the retrocalcaneal region. Normally, ultrasound is the choice of investigation, which I do before I operate all these patients. And ultrasound is uh, essentially done actually to see whether there is intratendinous calcification or not. And if you have intratendinous calcifications, then I do not operate these patients endoscopically to take out the Hagelin's bump. So retrocalcaneal bursitis is a condition which may be 
combined with insertional actually tendinopathy so more often than not when you get the patient you have a painful bump at the posterior superior aspect of the calcaneum and you also have a retrocalcaneal bursitis associated with it so nick wandick again who was pioneer in finding out this uh, uh, technique uh, he actually started doing this with a tendoscopy and he performed about 40 consecutive patients uh, where there were extra articular tendon pathologies and he did it for anterior uh, tendons he did it for peroneal tendons he also did it for the posterior tendons to further this nick wandick then in a study uh, of 21 procedures in 20 patients uh, he he uh, stated that uh, all those who were unresponsive to non operative treatment for more than 6 months uh, were taken off for surgery and according to him, he had four patients who had good results and the remaining 15 patients had excellent results. So furthering this, then this technique became uh, 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 pretty rampant. And uh, my experience with this uh, in our center, right from 2012 to 20, we did total number of about 30 cases out of which 10 were males, 20 were females. There was one case of reattachment of the tendon, so we had to take down tendon in one patient. The exclusion criteria was intratendinous calcification, which was confirmed by a preoperative ultrasound. There were no skin or portal related complications. And the indication in our cases were failed conservative treatment for six weeks, because six months is a little too last time for Indian population to really follow with the rehab protocol. The results were encouraging. And we are planning uh, uh, to analyze all our results of endoscopic haglins very soon. We are writing a paper on it. Maybe we will come up very soon. So that was the basic data. Now, going to the cases, this is case one, where the patient is a 40 years old male with moderate obesity, complaining of pain and swelling in the left retrocalcaneal region. X-ray and USG of the ankle were taken and diagnosed having haglins bump with retrocalcaneal bursitis. Calcification tendon was ruled out by USG. He was given about six months of conservative treatment as this patient stayed nearby and was compliant with conservatism, but failed to improve. And what I want to highlight is fowler philip angle. So there are different angles which are calculated when you are dealing with the Hagelin's bump. And these are two angles, which were fowler philip and Rush angle, which actually tells you what is the degree of Hagelin's bump which you are dealing with. So fowler philip angle is the relation of the inferior calcaneus to the posterior calcaneus. Normally, it measures about 44 to 69 degrees. And the values which are greater than 75 degrees, they are supposed to be abnormal and they might require a surgical excision. Rush described the influence of calcaneal inclination on this fowler philip angle and which you can see in this picture. So that is the flat line which goes, that's the posterior superior bump. So actually this is the fowler philip angle and that is the calcaneal inclination. So these two angles were calculated in all the patients and to put it onto the patient's x-ray, you could see that. So that's the posterior superior bump there. That's the bump there. That is the angle and that's the calcaneal inclination. So typically the surgery is done in a prone position where patient is under spinal anesthesia. You put a small uh, IV uh, uh, fluid bottle below the shin of the tibia so that you have some space to work uh, below the uh, heel and you have to hang the legs beyond the table so that you can make free movements of your hands as well as you can put your image intensifier to see the completion of procedure, which I normally do at the end of the procedure. So that's the classical position. And when you see this, what one needs to do as a surgical tip is, you need to orient yourself with the view which you get onto the, uh, onto the screen. Because the position is odd, the patient is in prone position, it takes little time for someone to really adjust to it. Now you can see here, this is the excised Hagelin's bump. This is a tendo achilles. So you, in a prone position, see tendo achilles at the top and the calcaneus is at the bottom. So this is tendoachillus and that is the calcaneum. And that is probably the end result of the surgery when you remove the bump. For the beginners who start undertaking this surgery, one useful tip is at the bump, you just push in an 18 gauge needle through the tendon into the retrocalcaneal space. And what happens is then the needle tells you where the tendoachillus lies 
and that is a danger zone and one can always stay away from the, that uh, danger zone by having a look at the needle. So that is the complete excision in a prone position. Now there are certain situations where the patients are so obese as I showed you in the first, uh, uh, in my first case, that the anesthetist is reluctant to make these patients prone. So we had such a situation in the case which, is, which I'm going to present. And in that situation, then we developed a technique where we did Haglund's excision in all lateral portals or in lateral or floppy lateral position. So here the patient lies in a sloppy lateral position and we have done Haglund's excision via two lateral portals instead of taking one lateral and another medial portal alongside the tendo achilles. So this is the fibular tip. That is the uh, tendo achilles marking. And you drop a line which starts from the fibular tip to the tendo achilles. And exactly there is your portal site, which is para tendon. So you have to take a portal, which is your viewing portal, just parallel to the tendon. And you can take your operating portal, say about four or five millimeters away from this. So that is how it looks when you put your scope. This is the viewing portal. This is the operating portal. And you can do this surgery in all lateral position as well. So that is the video of all lateral position. Now here the orientation has changed. Since I was used to doing these cases in prone position, what I did was I rotated my scope to have that same position. Now see, tendo achilles is here, Hagelin's bump is there. You can identify this Hagelin bump because it has got a cartilaginous cap. Now I've rotated my scope to make tendo achilles superior so it is easier for me to orient and have my surgical dexterity. Though that, those red areas which you saw were inflamed synovial tissue into the retrocalcaneal region. So with the help of a shaver and a radio frequency, you delineate the Hagelin's bump and that's the radio frequency being used. You can very safely use it here. Nothing goes wrong. And you have ample of space to work. This is the cartilaginous cap which you see. So as there is a lot of fatty tissue there, until unless you see this cartilaginous cap, you will have to keep on dissecting. And once you have dissected it all through, I usually take a small osteotome. And as it is just about an exostosis, which easily comes out, make that osteotome walk through from medial to lateral side or lateral to medial side, whatever is convenient for you. And you can just scoop the whole thing open there and then remove the rest of the pieces with the help of uh, your clamp. And then you can round the edges by using an acromionizer or, a, 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 or an arthroscopic bar there. So that's the way uh, how it is done. So sc scooping it out with the help of uh, osteotome hardly takes you about four or five minutes and then uh, you really reduce on your surgical time. So there you can see tendo achil is there and that's the bump. Now, if you have got to take out the superficial spur, you'll have to go beyond this, which is not possible while doing an endoscopic excision. That is why if you have got to remove the superficial calcaneal spur as well, you'll have to take down the tendo achil is from here and then you'll have to access that spur, which arthroscopically or endoscopically is not possible. So that is the post-op picture you can see here. I always check this on an image intensifier to see that I have taken out the uh, bump uh, uh, adequately. And uh, that is the clinical picture where you see there's hardly any scar left. In this patient, I had taken two lateral port complications. So this was the technique which we published in JOCR. Uh, in 2017, I think, and the article is readily available on the web. Case number two, uh, uh, I wanted to show you that if, yeah, should I wait here? Should I wait here, Dr. Anta? Because, I think hello. Should I continue or wait? Continue. 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 Oh. Okay, so this is the case number two, which I wanted to show that when you have an avulsion of the superficial calcaneal spur. So when you get something of this kind, you're sure that probably the tendo achilles also has given way. So these are not ideal patients for endoscopic excision alone. So I wanted to show this since it is a enthesopathy, it is an insertional tendinopathy the principles of repair are same as that you see in a rotator cuff. So in this patient, we did a mixed procedure where initially in prone position, the posterior superior Haglund's bump was excised. And this is the 
so i'll go for the want of time if you want i can go a little fast and i'll show you what i wanted to actually so i removed that bum with an osteotome that's the burr going there and with the help of burr we rounded the edges now you can see tendoachill is there and it is detached now i can go beyond the deformity now with this radio frequency probe you can see that i can lift up the bony fragment that is the bony fragment there so that's a complete avulsion of the tendoachillis so if you really ignore this and just take out the bump the patient is not going to be uh, uh, all right so in this situation you need a mixed procedure where endoscopically you can remove the bump and then you can go ahead and do a open repair for of the tendoachillis so that is the arthroscopy portal which you can see that is the mini open that is the avulsed tendon and there you can see that was the uh, that was the piece of bone which had got avulsed so i debridded mm -hmm. the tendon to cut this piece of bone and then went ahead and did a double row repair as you do in a rotator cuff so i used here a self retrieving instrument which we use in our shoulder surgery and took the proximal row and these proximal row sutures were then tied in a mattress fashion so that is the mattress fashion in which they were uh, they were tied so now you have two sutures proximally placed so those are the mat and now there will be a distal anchor which will be put which would function as a double row repair of a tendo achillis now here you don't need to really dissect the tendon very high you have already taken care of the posterior superior bump so you have enough space the tendon has been nicely mobilized with the endoscopic procedure itself and then once you have done that what you do is you go for the you go for you go for uh, the distal row where uh, i'll be using Uh, uh, a swivel lock anchor like a situation so that's my starting owl and the starting owl is going in the sutures have been tied there the starting owl has made a necessary hole there and then on top of that what you do is you insert your swivel lock anchor so that's the swivel lock anchor which comes in you maintain the ankle in a neutral position here so you don't want to really uh, put it uh, too much under tension nor you want to put it too loose there so instead of uh, uh, a lot of plantar flexion as we do in a conventional open repairs this is just about a little under in the neutral and then once you have done that what you do is you repair rest of the paratenon with the repair tendon and that completes your repair If you have a look at uh, this in the X-ray format, now this is how the X-ray would look. So that is your medial row. That's the excised Hagelin's bump which you had there, and then you have uh, lat, uh, the uh, the distal row in the form of a swivel lock anchor, and that is after one month the patient was put into slab for about four weeks, and after four weeks the rehab protocol started with uh, active ankle movements and wet belly was delayed for about 6 to 8 weeks so to conclude endoscopic excision is a good option in both cases even if you have calcification you can do endoscopic work uh, uh, first and then take down the tendon and repair it it is minimally invasive it is easily reproducible it is devoid of skin complications and most importantly you should rule out intratendon calcification uh, before you undertake the endoscopic excision i thank you for your attention thank you dr melin for such a wonderful lecture it was so an innovative procedure and something to uh, teach us how to see about the tendon uh, avulsion uh, melin there are so many angles here uh, uh you talk about the fowler philip angle the bowler's angle the chavanel lieff angle the calcanel peach angle which are yeah. the angles that you have to yeah. depend upon so i have relied more on fowler philip angle and yeah. the rush modification which i showed actually there is a lot of controversy how to calculate these angles some people they say that you should 
take wet bearing pictures some people they say may not take wet bearing pictures and to over posterior bump and not at the insertion side of the tendo uh, HLS. That is a superficial calcaneal spur. If it is the tendinous superficial calcaneal spur, this is not the right patient for all endoscopic procedure. <laughs> and invariably, you'll see that these patients also have retrocalcaneal swelling. So there is a bulky swelling, posterior superior bump, which is seen on the X-ray as a Haglund's deformity. Then what remains is uh, academic importance of import calculating an angle show that it is abnormal and then have an indication of surgery. But I think more so ever, it is a clinical presentation which would uh, patient want to take this procedure. So, to me, foul lip rush. Lynn, where are you? Lynn, where are you? Sundar Rajan, can you take over? Yes, sir. Uh, do you uh, do the same procedure? Sir, I, I, as I uh, said, and most often the Hanglin's deformity with retrocalcular bursitis is associated with the incisional tendinopathy. So very rarely we find isolated Hanglin's deformity pump, which causing retrocalcular bursitis, where these patients tend to have a pain only on the pain on the SR set uh, on the oh. lateral, either side of the tendinopathy tendon. So whenever the patient has got a tenderness on the midline, then most often they are associated with the incisional tendinopathy, where in that case, isolated hang lens excision will not work. So okay. here we have to do an uh, open procedure. As SSR showed, you can do an uh, endoscopic excision of a uh, hang lens bump and you can open up and do the uh, remaining uh, spur excision. Or as I do always, just midline incision, take off the tendochilus, take off the spur, then same time hang lens deformity, then you repair back the tendochilus. So this is the most common situation usually happens in our practice. Uh, if uh, you also do an MRI or don't do MRI? So I stopped doing MRI uh, for this incisional tendinopathy uh, because most often we, where you require MRI is when they have an incisional tendinopathy, especially for your management point of view, to know how much degeneration have been taking place in the attachment of the tendochilus. So if there is more than 50% of degeneration is happening in the tendochilus, then you may need to augment with the FHL. Okay. So that preoperatively, that may help you to determine. But most often, uh, I counsel the patients that I go inside and see because what you see is more important than in MRI. So you do excise the degenerative tendon. Then if I see that more than 50% of the attachment of the tendochilus is gone, then I may augment with the ferroxyrhylsis longus. So yes, now yes. I stopped doing MRI even for incisional tendinopathy. Yes, yes, Sundar, completely agree uh, yeah. with you. I, even I don't do the MRI for this thing because I think it is an over investigation for that. If I find mm -hmm. that more than 50% is gone, I will rather counsel for the FHL to just add on. Uh, Milan, you are coming? Yeah, yeah I have yeah. come. You, you, have, you have any comments to that? Uh, uh, actually, I uh, totally agree with Sundar and uh, Swaranandu both. Because, uh, see, uh, the point which I wanted to put forth was, what is symptomatic? Invariably, when you have a Haglund's disease, you will have superficial calcaneal spurs. But are they symptomatic? So in that situation where you have a tenderness only isolated on the posterior superior aspect of the calcaneum, whereas insertional tendinopathy is not there. So you don't have tenderness over the superficial calcaneal spur. So I have left these patients alone and they have done exceedingly well. So I think it would be an overkill to do a tendon split in a X-ray proven patient not having symptoms. Do you see any partial tears of the tendon in uh, this? Uh, because yeah. so, I used to do a lot of this. Yeah, earlier. we do see. So there are long. Yeah, yeah. So you see a lot of longitudinal uh, splits into the tendo HLS at times, like you see while doing shoulder in subscap. Uh, uh, I have left them alone. I have never touched them. And I don't the, think they should be touched. The last do, question. Do, 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 do you do the ultrasonography? Because I think ultrasonography. Yeah, he said. Ultrasonography because yeah, I usually so I do, do that. ultrasonography because that gives it much, much more so, information from that. Okay. So I do only ultrasonography, Swaranendu. I don't do yeah, MRI yeah, scans. Because, because, yeah, yeah. Okay. Because, because ultrasonography is too much, too good for that. 
Okay, uh, the last question. Uh, there's a paper recently in May 2020 on uh, closed wedge osteotomy, a dorsal wedge osteotomy to correct the angles so that you have a long-term relief better than a short-term relief with only excising the bump because it's a degenerative disease. Your comments on that? <laughs> well, I, even I think Van, Van Nike is not doing that. Even the Van Nike is not doing that. Last time also when he came, he told like he's not doing it. He's still taking off that thing and doing the double row repair. Okay. Milind? Yeah, yeah. You're right. It's, I think, uh, doing too much for too little. So I wouldn't <laughs> really do an osteotomy <laughs> for uh, Hagelin's bump. Uh, uh, and. Uh, a, a, a wonderful work by Van Dyck, and this is, you know, a established procedure now. So I think we really uh, should look forward to. Okay, uh, can I just call upon Dr. Gopinath? Uh, yeah. Please share, sir. We must. Uh, the time is uh, running out. Mm -hmm. Please, no uh, problem. No problem. Yeah. During the video, video thing, we'll make up the time because they are all guest speakers. So they are they are taking time, no problem. <coughs> and, uh, Gopi is always he is a great great teacher. You know we do all know that he is running a big institute and he is involved in much of PG teaching is excellent. He is too good in that teaching purpose. Thank you, thank you for the invitation, Dr. Sarnand Samanda. I thank MOA for the nice words by Dr. Ram Sada. My topic is biceps stenosis. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, very yes. much. Okay, go ahead. So before going to the actual topic of biceps disease, I think we should know some of the important anatomical features of non head of biceps. We should remember that around 60% of cases, it is attached to the bony tubercle, but in around 40%, it is attached to the superior labrum. And in most of the cases, the attachment is dual. Most of the time, it is attached to the superior labrum and the bony tubercle. As we all know, bicepital groove is a hourglass shaped structure. And most of the time, we are not able to see what is happening inside the groove because there is a transverse humeral ligament. And uh, this creates problems for uh, uh, arthroscopic surgeons because many of the times we may not be able to visualize whole of the anatomy of the long head of bicep through arthroscope. We should remember that the bicepital groove uh, pain is the most important feature of uh, any long head of biceps lesions. And there are some anatomical restraints to the long head of biceps. And when there is a lesion of the subscapularis, you can get an abnormality in the long head of biceps. So there are restraints which has to be looked in into when you treat long head of biceps lesions, like coracohumeral ligament, the superior glenohumeral ligament, and these things are very important. And many of the times, a subscapularis lesion may be the hidden lesion, which would have caused a long head of biceps tendinitis. And the angular relationship of the biceps tendon in the groove predisposes it for most of the shear force and the degenerative stress for the long head of biceps. There are some functions which are described for the long head of biceps. Of course, it is controversial, I know. Uh, it's a static anterior superior stabilizer. It has got a depressor effect on the humeral head. Uh, it has got uh, some role in glenoid, uh, glenoid humeral stability. But if you look into literature, there are some contradictions also with this. Because when there is a static anterior and superior stabilizer, and when you do a tenotomy, most of the time nothing happens. And as a depressor, uh, it, it is contradictory because when you do the elbow EMG, not much uh, function is affected after doing a tenotomy of the long head of biceps. And even if you do a long head of biceps uh, uh, tenotomy, glenohumeral stability is not affected. So. Uh, we all know that there are a lot of controversies regarding a uh, long head of biceps tendon. And uh, we should remember that we are not understood much about this tendon. That may be the reason for all these controversies. So we are uh, yet to learn more and more about this particular structure, anatomical structure, the long head of biceps tendon. There is a publication by Moon et al. in 2015 in the American Journal of Sports Medicine, where he describes it in different sources. He describes an intra-articular portion and an extra-articular portion. Intra-articular portion is actually the biceps uh, uh, labral complex. And then you have an angular portion uh, that is also intra-articular. But he has stretched more on the extra-articular portion, that is the long head of biceps within the bicepital groove. 
uh, from the articular margin to the distal margin of the uh, subscapularis tendon. That portion is described as zone one. From the distal medial subscapularis to the proximal medial pectoralis major, that is a zone two, and distal to the proximal medial pectoralis major is a zone three. And most of the time, the zone one and two, uh, and uh, this intra tuberous or where the it is covered by transfemoral ligament the time uh, arthroscopic features uh, are negative so it's called as a no and we don't know what's happening inside this group there may be synovitis there may be stenosing synovitis there could be loose bodies there may be tendinitis partial tear all this within the group so how do you proceed controversy so a biceps lat uh, lateral complex and the biceps anchor is the first zone second zone is a junctional zone from the uh, biceps uh, labral complex to the articular margin, and zone three is uh, from the articular margin to the distal medial subscapularis. Zone two is from the distal medial subscapularis to the proximal medial pectoralis major, and which is described as a uh, no man's land. And zone three is distal to the proximal medial pectoralis major. Now, diagnosis is going to be difficult when you don't see it through the scope. So most of the time you have to rely on the MRI or uh, on clinical examination. But if you look into the details of the MRI, most of the time MRI also may not help you to diagnose the intratuberous or where in the bicepital group what is happening. Uh, it is very difficult in the MRI also. So how do you diagnose this? So this is one particular area where you should concentrate more on clinical tests. Clinical tests also may not be always 100%, but uh, uh, this has to be stretched. The clinical examination has to be stressed when we discuss that, about this particular anatomical structure. So you have to do some tests like uh, a subpectoral long head of biceps tendon test. You have to palpate the tendon medial to the pectoralis major while internally rotated. You have to do the clinical tests like speed test, ergosense test, and in, this, in detail as a three-pack test. And this is described in literature. And uh, some of the arthroscopic surgeon feels that you can pull the long head of biceps into the joint and examine it, but it is unreliable in terms of diagnosis. And it should not be considered as a reliable benchmark. And uh, uh, during arthroscopy. So most of the time you depend on three tests. This is described in literature as uh, you do O'Brien's test, uh, a throwing test, and then compression test. So these three tests will give some idea regarding what's happening in the bicepital groove to this tendon. So this is the inside view. As I told, you may not be able to visualize uh, the structure under the transverse humeral ligament. Now we'll come on, we'll come to the topic proper, uh, bicepital tenodesis. What are the indications? The duration of symptoms, and in shoulder pain, clicking or the popping sound, night pain, weakness. These are uh, some of the indications for uh, doing biceps tenodesis. And instability of the tendon may be seen as a popping of the tendon or a popping sound. It could be inflammation, degenerative tendinitis, or rotative, rotative tear. So when there is a tendinitis, you should always rule out rotative tear because primary tendinitis is not very common in uh, biceps tendon. So biceps tendon is affected by other rotator cuff lesions like uh, subscap lesions or uh, some other rotator cuff lesions. So instability or subluxation or dislocation uh, within the groove is another issue, which is always present when you look for it. And uh, tear in the coracohumeral ligament or subscap has to be ruled out. Many a times subscap lesion is a hidden lesion, which you miss when you talk about uh, long head of biceps tendon. So when you see a uh, tendinitis or a partial rupture or tear of the biceps, you always look at the subscap, especially the subscap. And then you look for the slap, as we all know. Anatomy, extraarticular tenodesis, subpectoral tenodesis, or uh, intraarticular tenodesis, these are controversies. And tenotomy versus tenodesis, another controversy. And the sites of tenodesis also uh, debated in most of the meetings. So biceps tenodesis is indicated for younger active patients, thinner arms, and they do not want a cosmetic abnormality. And then they are manual laborers and those willing to partake in a good rehabilitation. So biceps tenotomy does not need much rehabilitation, but uh, tenodesis really needs rehabilitation for the best outcome. So bicepital tunnel decompressing technique. This is mainly because of our inability to rule out a tunnel disease. We are not sure what is happening within the tunnel. The best way is to decompress it. So bicepital tunnel decompressing technique is a useful surgery when we talk about a long head of biceps lesions. You can do a subtaltoid tenodesis. You can do a subpectoral tenodesis, which could be mini open, or arthroscopic subpectoral tenodesis. And the proximal tenodesis with the tunnel decompression uh, is also a good procedure through zone 2. So in the zone 2 lesions, 
you can do a tno disease as well as you can uh, decompress it because you don't know what is happening within the bicipital group so the treatment uh, is a uh, tno disease when it is indicated it depends on the pathology of the long head of biceps co existing shoulder pathology the age symptoms and the level of functions so you can go for a conservative or operative and when you decided on tno disease Uh, most of the time is for a resistant or uh, resistant to conservative treatment irreversible changes like tearing or fraying decrease in tendon size and subluxation of the tendons on the bicipital groove recurrent subluxation or dislocation of the bicipital from the groove and also instability of the tendon and relative indications are in failed subacromial decompression with persistent symptoms and there are some studies which shows that when you have done a good uh, prosthetic of repair Uh, long term degeneration and pain in the uh, biceps is very common especially in the old age so you have to address biceps when you do a uh, rotator cuff repair as well what are the, what are the pros for biceps tenodesis the goal is to maintain the length and tension relationship of biceps it may prevent postoperative mus muscular atrophy it may prevent fatigue cramping help to maintain the normal contour of the uh, contour of the biceps so this is a uh, these are the indications of this are good things about biceps tenodesis and the advantage is it could cause pain and it is called the pain so the advantage is maintain length and tension of the tendon prevents loss of forearm supination so that is the advantage and prevents cramping of the muscles and avoids cosmetically unpleasant papoise deformity which may bother many of the young patients what are the methods of tenodesis there are multiple options can be performed proximally with the tendon in the groove or distally with the tendon out of the groove and the proximal can be done arthroscopically distal is a mini open and most of the time we are doing a subpectoral distal tenodesis but there are some surgeons who does arthroscopic sub subpectoral tenodesis as well so is a arthroscopic subpectoral or open subpectoral high in the groove soft tissue tenodesis or bony tenodesis these are the options available to us and subdeltoid is an all arthroscopic technique where uh, you pull out the tendon from the aperture in the biceps uh, uh, biceps uh, aponeurosis and then you pull it anteriorly and attach it to the conjoined tendon so these are the soft tissue options available to us you can attach it to the shorter of biceps extra articularly you can pull it from intra articular portion and attach it to the shorter of biceps transverse femoral ligament to the conjoined tendon Uh, repair the site of the rotator cuff especially in those cases of a uh, superior capsular reconstruction which has been discussed uh, quite well in the last uh, presentation uh, you can use uh, biceps as a superior capsular reconstruction and attach it to the uh, insertion site of the rotator cuff especially the supraspinatus and uh, it can be uh, done with tenotomy or without tenotomy and the supraspinatus uh, interval or rotator interval is other areas where you can attach so there are multiple areas where you can do a soft tissue tenodesis now bony tenodesis there are several methods so you can use an anchor or a bone tunnel or a transhumeral head guide pin and these are the different methods of doing a bony tenodesis so interference screw is a gold standard when we do a proximal tenodesis after doing a decompression of the bicipital groove you can attach it proximally into the humerus itself uh, using an interference screw that is a proximal intra articular or arthroscopic uh, bony tenodesis so biceps tenodesis and superior capsular reconstruction is a recent advance and most of the webinars we have heard on ias also described mostly from japan and korea they do uh, with tenotomy uh, with a distal tenotomy and tenodesis the rest of the tendon is used for superior capsular reconstruction and there are some surgeons who decompress the tendon and do the superior capsular reconstruction without tenotomy and attach it to the site of repair of the uh, rotator cuff so subpectoral uh, tenodesis is a gold standard in many cases because it never causes anterior knee pain that is the advantage but the disadvantage is it is mostly done as a mini open technique but if you can do it through the arthroscope it may be great but uh, we don't have any experience of subpectoral tenodesis through the arthroscope we do a mini open technique so you can do in lateral decubitus position or in the that position uh, you make a small incision uh, at the lower border of the pectoralis minor major and uh, long head of biceps is easily palpable and before doing it you, you can do an arthroscopic tenotomy from inside and then pull out the tendon just below the uh, pectoralis major and then make a small hole and attach it with an anchor or interference screw whatever method you can use so uh, this is a very easy technique 
and you can try it over endo button or do any fixation. But the important point is where is where should you attach it separately? Uh, this is an article published in American Journal of Sports Medicine. They say that it should be three centimeter distal to the distal border of the pectoralis major tendon, where it maintains the length and tension and gives the best outcome. So if uh, uh, you look at the literature, you will come to know that subpectoral tenor disease is uh, very good in, in young active individuals and adults, and especially in patients, and it gives the best possible result. If you look at the literature review regarding tenor disease, English literature says that uh, uh, in the early 90s, uh, early 2000s, and late 2000s, the tenotomy and tenor disease have little difference to offer. Higher incidence of cosmetic deformity is seen in patients treated with the bicepital tenotomy compared to tenor disease with associated lower load to the tendon failure. So literature-wise, there is not much difference in the outcome of tenotomy, but if you really look into the literature, you'll come to know that if the patient is younger, uh, less than 55 years and skinny and cosmetic condition is a problem. Uh, if the patient is young, it's better to do tenotomy. If the patient is older, uh, chronic significant pain relief, uh, probably tenotomy also may be good, but it's always a controversy. There's no uh, consensus in literature regarding this procedure and tenotomy. Uh, patient factors and demands are important, need high levels of evidence, controlled, randomized uh, controlled studies uh, with uh, more studies with more power with well-defined study variables to finally conclude that uh, tenodesis or tenotomy is going to work in uh, literature evidence. And we should always remember that subscap tears, the hidden lesions of the subscalaparis can cause a persistent group pain after uh, rotator cuff repair. And this could be due to a bicepital tendinitis or a lesion in the canal, bicepital tunnel. So isolated biceps pulley tears are treated with a subpectoral tenodesis. They have a good outcome. And bicepital degeneration after rotator cuff repair is a reality. And uh, you have to always look at the biceps when you do a very good rotator cuff repair. So even if you do a best uh, rotator cuff repair, patient may be symptomatic due to a biceps lesion. Again, slab tear and bicep stenodesis, age, activity, level, uh, and status of the labrum. Uh, you can do a arthroscopic tenotomy and tenodesis followed by mini open subpectoral or in particular tenodesis. Treatment of long head of biceps uh, with RCT tenodesis or tenotomy. This is a study published in the year 2017. Tenodesis is superior to tenotomy if the tear is more than four centimeter and age is less than 55 years. And uh, no significant difference is seen in this study in patients older than 55 years and tear less than four centimeter. So if the tear is less than four centimeter and age is 55 years or less, you do a tenodesis. If the age is more than 45, 55 years and the tear is less than 4 centimeters, you do a tenotomy. This is from this study in 2017. Of course, you have to follow a rehab program like a sling for four weeks, no active elbow flexion or supination exercise uh, for four weeks, then strengthening exercise for eight weeks and un unrestricted activities at three to four months. This is a rehabilitation you have to follow. To summarize this presentation, functional anatomy creates environment for pathology. We look for and treat the associated pathology like a rotator cuff lesion, especially the subscap tear, the hidden subscap tear. Acute ruptures are generally investigated for rotator cuff tears, chronic ruptures, tenodesis only if symptomatic. So involvement of rotator cuff pathologies are most common. Inflammation, tenosynovitis, tendinosis, mechanical damage, and chronic overuse. And most of the time, primary is not seen. So when there is a tendinosis or tendinitis, you have to rule out rotator cuff lesion. Uh, you have to look for instability of, in the in the uh, tunnel, bicepital tunnel, and treat it. Involvement with slab tears is very common, and uh, you can address the biceps. And most of the time, slab repair may not be needed. Thank you for patient listening. Thank you, Dr. Gopinathan, for uh, extensive uh, review and uh, lecture, which is so informative. Uh, so you will do uh, tenotomy or tenodesis. Suppose say you have a 55 over patient and uh, tear is more than uh, less than uh, uh, four centimeters. Still you do tenotomy or tenodesis? Uh, tenodesis teno teno is ideal. It is four centimeter and 55 years old. Tenodesis is the best option. 
but if the tendon is in flame and disease no that is not that is not the issue tendon is inflamed or uh, degenerated you can debride it you can remove some of the frayed part still you can do tenodesis and uh, it is in the old age that you do superior capsular reconstruction with the biceps so even in the old age biceps has got its own role don't do and cut it away but instead you can use it for a superior capsular reconstruction so it is better that you do tenodesis but gopi some of the european surgeon even the french big shots they believe that this biceps has no uh, right to stay inside the joint once there is a big cuff here so i so some people are so aggressive on the biceps this biceps is no right to stay inside the joint what's your take on that uh, i know this is a very very big topic and there are a lot of controversies so it was a big topic even in uh, in america people in the western population they think more of a tenotomy and the eastern <laughs> like uh, korea japan they feel that tenodesis is better uh, this topic will never end because i think we are not studied well about the biceps tendon uh, anatomy itself we don't know what's happening to the tendon what's the role what's the function we don't know so controversy is not going to end it's like saying as long as you show your biceps you are attractive <laughs> yes uh, biceps okay. biceps is a cosmetic muscle <laughs> all right so can we go now to the video section Thank you, thank you, Dr. Gopi Nathan, for an excellent review and the nice lecture. Thank you, Gopi. Uh, now we have the video section: uh, meniscus root repair and extra corrective surgery uh, by Dr. Sreesh Gajar. Uh, all arthroscopic have seen uh, Dr. Sreesh Gajar every day in the IS webinar uh, for nicely modulating the. Uh, the webinars uh, with intelligent questions he is from uh, he works at kokala ben hospital was a past editor of the uh, indian arthrop uh, journal also uh, he is member of many uh, societies and uh, faculty uh, both national international and uh, very called often to deliver lectures over to you dr shreyas gajjal Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, moderators, Dr. Antao, for the kind introduction, and Dr. Pimprikar, also to Team IAS, uh, Team Momentum, for the invite. So this is a video lecture on meniscal root repair and centralization. I work in Kokila Ben Hospital in Mumbai. So what do we know as far as uh, meniscus goes? We know that meniscus in the last century is a very important role in joint preservation. and although initially we started doing total meniscectomies we then realized and we did partial and nowadays we are trying to repair the so called preserve the meniscus to prevent osteoarthritis and initially the meniscal repairs were restricted to the vascular zone but now uh, of late we are also addressing the transitional or the avascular zone with our intention to preserve the meniscus now as far as the meniscal roots go Uh, the there are two of them one anterior and one posterior and they are defined as a tear within a centimeter of the meniscal insertion or avulsions at the insertion of the meniscus and when one has a root tear it causes failure of the meniscus to convert axial loads to transverse hoop stresses which leads to accelerated cartilage degeneration with changes which are comparable to a total meniscectomy when the extrusion is more than 3 mm so on arthroscopy this is how typically a posterior root tear of the medial meniscus would look like uh, ideally that root should be seated down onto the posterior tibial plateau there is a classification uh, to to determine the uh, level of root tears as it be for various conditions now another important thing to bear in mind is the coronary ligaments and they are circumferential ligaments around both the medial and lateral menisci which stabilize the menisci on the tibial plateau prevent extrusion and importantly resist rotational forces so what happens is that when you have a meniscal injury there is an altered biomechanics of the knee joint which leads to alteration in force to the cartilage meniscus and the associated stabilizing structures which is the injury to the menisco tibial or the coronary ligament and that leads to meniscal extrusion which is partial or total displacement of the meniscus of the tibial plateau and the tibial articular cartilage and a meniscal position which is more than 3 mm outside the margin of the tibial plateau typically noted on an mri so this is what a diagrammatic representation of a meniscal 
extrusion is and this is what it would look like on an mr image a coronal view now what happens is that if you don't treat this entity uh, over a period of time it progresses to osteoarthritis and leading to some form of uh, an arthroplasty and uh, typically the presentation is acute in a young patient or degenerative in a chronic middle aged woman and what is important to note is a lot of these patients when you uh, ask them closely they might have some niggling pain in in the knee from before but suddenly their pain becomes worse and typically from getting up from a seated position sometimes they can recollect a popping sound on examination there is effusion joint line tenderness and the risk factors are presence of varus uh, malalignment and a high bmi there are three signs which are described extrusion of more than 3 mm or an axial cut a presence of radial tear but obviously the section has to be accurate to pick this uh, finding and the so called ghost sign because the root is out of position now non operative treatment is typically reserved for the elderly people but i determine that based on the physiological rather than the chronological age uh, patients who have significant comorbidities a high bmi generally out of uh, out of bridge grade 3 and 4 presence of mal alignment more than 5 degrees and if there is an irreparable tear but what has been noted is that non operative treatment unfortunately leads to poor outcomes and progression to osteoarthritis and a high rate of conversion to arthroplasty and this is worse in women and the evidence as far as root tear uh, repair goes is that there is a 92% survival so i'm just coming to the case i just wanted to build up a uh, you know the background to understand so this is a 45 year old female Uh, who presented to me with the findings i highlighted it's very important to do a, a hip knee ankle uh, scanogram as highlighted in the high tibial osteotomy talk to ensure that there is no varus mal alignment more than 5 degrees which was not so in this patient and on the mri what we found is that there was an extrusion of the meniscal root by more than 3 mm so what we did is uh, the root repair procedure which i'm going to highlight so this is a left knee that's the root tear uh, you can see there's also some changes on the femoral and the tibial side and the menisca is extruded out you can see that it's gone out of the uh, medial tibial plateau and then what we need to do step wise is to first prepare that uh, area so that's the root tear you can see on a closer look uh, and then we uh, you can see the tibial lesion on the plateau as well so what we do is we use a rasp here or some kind of a meniscal uh, a uh, burr or a rasp handheld and we try and clear or refine that area as you can see shortly going in so this is the instrument which we have been using for the peripheral meniscal uh, tear repair so it's important to create a raw breeding edge along the area of the detachment of the menisco tibial ligament right from back to front and once you've created that raw area it's important that you use uh, a day a shaver as you would do in any kind of uh, a repair type of a procedure to ensure that you have clear raw ends and that's the shaver going in in that uh, medial tibial plateau area to try and uh, clear off the defect and pre prepare a raw uh, bleeding area thereafter what we do is we go on to do a root repair as we would do so uh, and there are dedicated jigs available and i do a typically uh, a tunnel from the anterior medial tibial cortex going on to the footprint of the meniscal root now one can drill through and through or use some kind of a, a a socket preparation and this is what i have done here and thereafter you pass the sutures through the root it's i prefer to do the tunnel placement first because it will prevent any suture cutouts so again there are dedicated low profile instruments and there are a few configurations but this uh, loop and uh, tack or the so called uh, cinch loop or the luggage tack suture is shown to be biomechanical strong and uh, i tend to use two such uh, for a root type of problem and this is the second suture going in and it's important that once we pass the uh, two sutures then we uh, from a retrograde uh, fashion we pass the suture through the socket or the uh, tibial tunnel which we have created to railroad yeah, yeah. this and you can see that yeah, suture uh, seen issue the administrative issue and that is uh, retracted uh, through the anterior tibial cortex and then we uh, railroad these sutures down uh, 
from the posterior uh, root attachment to the anterior tibial cortex and they are fixed with an anterior tibial button or an anchor. Next, we go on to addressing the medial uh, meniscotibial injury. So, uh, two needles are passed, a Venflow needles, uh, to the area where we want to bridge uh, and repair the medial meniscotibial ligament. And on the outside, percutaneous approach, anchors are passed. And you can see that then the two sutures are connected like a bridge. And that will reinforce or repair the medial meniscotibial ligament. And that's the end result uh, that the, the uh, if you can see here, I'll just... Uh, uh, briefly pause uh, that the that the menisca is now reduced well onto the tibia which it wasn't so before so not only is the root repair important it's also important that the centralization procedure is performed uh, wherever necessary in whichever cases to ensure that this will not uh, the outcome will not deteriorate typically post operatively the knee is immobilized in a brace for 2 weeks and partial or non weight bearing is encouraged for the first 6 weeks Knee range of motions commences from week two to week six, and no squats are allowed for 12 weeks. But if you look at the Korean papers, which have published five to eight year outcomes, they say that patients should be told to avoid deep squats lifelong. Otherwise, the risk of failure is very high. So this is that lady at follow-up. You can see the alignment uh, of the legs. And if you look closely, this is where I've gone with the anchors. And they are placed typically three millimeters uh, distal to the uh, tibial plateau which is where the meniscotibial ligament attaches. So in summary, root tears are often overlooked because of associated osteoarthritis, but really we have to uh, identify the right patient and offer surgical repair to improve clinical outcomes and delay joint deterioration. The goal of surgery is to restore the meniscal function, importantly reduce or correct extrusion, thereby increasing the stability by repairing the meniscotibial insufficiency but what remains to be seen in the long term, say more than 10 years of follow-up, is whether this kind of surgery would ultimately alter the progression of cartilage degeneration. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Thank you sir, uh, for a lovely presentation. Uh, Thank you. Uh, having described the meniscus root lesions in 2000, I feel when you have uh, kissing lesions, both uh, uh, cartilage damage in the femur as well as tibia, uh, according to me, is uh, not a good indication for the repair. Uh, can I just uh, take your thoughts on that? Yeah, yes. You're yes, you're absolutely right. I mean, see, these are, again, evolving surgeries. And uh, this patient was, as I highlighted, a 45-year-old. Alignment was normal. She was typically having only medial-sided symptoms. So uh, obviously, if this surgery fails, which we don't know what happens in the mid or long term, we always have another solution of doing a high tibial osteotomy or something else. But if we don't prevent, and she distinctly had that acute on chronic pain. So she didn't have much of a chronic pain, but there was a distinct acuteness of pain, which failed conservative management for around six weeks. And these were the findings. So obviously, in association with the kissing lesion, the results might be slightly inferior uh, compared to just having an isolated root tear. But when we see these patients in clinical practice, they come to us at various stages of their problem. So sometimes the problem is advanced. And I felt in a young patient like this, with just a unique compartment involvement, this would be the best option, at least for the time being. Yes, Milind, Milind is waiting. Nicola, sir, Milind, Milind is asking something. <laughs> yeah, Shreyas, uh, wonderful. I mean, uh, you have... Uh, uh, can I go ahead? Yes, 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 yes. Thank you. Yeah. Shreyas, uh, a very nice, wonderful presentation. So, you have uh, shifted the focus to the uh, coronary or meniscotibial ligaments. And you feel that that is the cause of uh, failure of those ligaments is a cause of extrusion. But I have also done about four centralization, but I did it all arthroscopic, where I pushed in an all suture anchor onto the uh, tibial plateau and uh, used shoulder uh, instruments like acupas to shuttle my suture around to the uh, inferior to the meniscus and pull that meniscus mechanically in. My concept was when you do a centralization procedure, you are doing something like a SCR to provide some scaffold between or a soft tissue uh, spacer between the two bones. How much really these coronary ligaments would make a difference by doing it outside in? Uh, doing it all inside is a very sweet procedure and you can just do it in about 10-15 minutes. 
Yeah, I, I understand and I agree that there is there are techniques and Laprade has also talked about it. But when you have a wide area of uh, medial meniscotibial insufficiency, as I showed in this case, you really need to buttress it or you'll have to put more than one anchor. So, you know, if you have right. a small area, which is posterior medial, then perhaps a single anchor and obviously in that uh, posterior zone, you, you know, with the neurovascular risk, you would prefer an all inside type of technique. But as you have an extended area, which is extending to the mid part of the body, I, I feel that the bridging concept where you really reinforce from back to front would help. And this is where a percutaneous approach uh, makes a difference. Uh, uh did you take a stress x-ray to know the insufficiency? Yeah, now very Vargas, good point. Vargas stress x-ray? Yes, very good point. And, you know, obviously when you have a video technique talk, as you were prompting, it's difficult to cover everything. But what uh, this uh, the, the, the what papers have published is that they do dynamic ultrasounds, if not stress X-rays, to see whether the extrusion is reducible or not. So one of the contraindication of doing a medial meniscotibial repair is that if the meniscus extrusion is not reducible, then this would not succeed. So yes, either stress views or a dynamic ultrasound would help determine that. With okay. uh, with the root tear shreyas, do you feel that dynamic ultrasound would show the meniscal movements? No. Uh, well, no, it is at the <laughs> back and obviously you need a trained and experienced sonologist. Uh, an MRI would show that, but yes, yes. So, uh, yes. There, are, there are cases, whereas the medial meniscal tibial, there are some case reports of isolated, uh, you know, in young patients and they have done a repair and that has resolved the symptoms. So perhaps in those cases, because MRI is not dynamic and ultrasound would make a difference. Yes, yes, uh -huh. MRI is very good. Even now, Shreyas, there is a now new grade. Three grades are coming probably. Melinda, you people, are, Nicholas said, you are too good in academics. You might be knowing that there are three grades, how the meniscus is extruded in MRI that you can see even in the coronal films. Nicholas, okay. sir, any thought on that? There are thoughts on that, but uh, I feel a simple procedure like uh, what we had described in our article in 2000, posterior medial release can get the meniscus back into the position. And it also uh, increases the blood supply to that area. And uh, uh, preferably we can get a good repair at the right place. Because when you have a chronic uh, tear, which is subluxated or uh, gone in the gutter, you need, there's some sort of a shortening of the, this. You're absolutely right. And it's I just... think maybe Laprade is following your technique, what you published in 2000, <laughs> because what they're saying is that when, when the extrusion is not reducible, they release the meniscofemoral side of the uh, ligament to try and reduce it back and then add the sutures uh, all inside as Milind was describing. So yes, but what they are now highlighting, so earlier we started with just doing isolated root repairs, but then we realized that the extrusion does not reduce and you know that could be a possible cause of progression. So therefore now we are in addition adding a centralization procedure to correct the extrusion as well, which uh, theoretically we believe that would slow down the OA. Yes, Anta sir added an excellent point that in chronic tears you have to release the posterior medial side. Otherwise, it is not going to come because in Laprade four and five, it is very difficult to even suture back your roots. It will it will tear off, tear apart. Sir, okay. yes? <coughs> posterior, uh, posterior yeah. medial from outside because if Inside. you are going to create a ramp lesion to repair the root, I think that would be probably a disaster. So, no, 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 right, no. Milin. So, what happened is I heard Laprad in one of the webinars, yeah. and exactly the same question was asked: that do you okay. create a ramp or do you create instability? Right. So he said that actually in biomechanical studies, and obviously we don't have long-term publication, but he said it doesn't happen, and obviously this is an arthritic group, so you know they are not going to be that active, and he says that everything scars or fibrosis. So your concern yes, is yes. absolutely valid, but there is no uh, clinical data yet to highlight that. Now we go to the next. Move it other uh, ways. Next topic. Is Sundar, is... Sundar, Sundar was pointing something. Sundar. Mm. Sundar. Yes, I, want, I want to add. So when we go for discussion like this, we, we know that I mean root repair itself is in a controversial surgery, and we know <laughs> that the results are good only it's in a grade one and grade two acute root uh, acute root tear cases where you have a middle aged females come with acute rupture without much arthritic changes with mild degeneration. Usually they do very well. So what Laprade and uh, like what Shreyesh or Blintz are discussed about the all the releases and doing the repair. By the time these patients are arthritic group, 
So already the prognosis, we don't know the pain is because of the arthritis or because of the root. Uh, that's why there's a lot of controversy exists whether to do a, that, do a such much, that much release and reattach it. So that is, uh, I mean, indication itself is in a big controversy for that group. Okay. okay. I think if you have bone edema on both the sides, that is femur and tibia, these patients will never do well. Yeah. Only tibial side edema, you might try and do a centralization, might work. But then bone edema is an ominous sign for a root repair. Okay. Uh, well taken. Uh, can we go to the next video by Dr. Sundar Rajan? Sundar Rajan is the past president of the Indian Association of Sports Medicine and Inc. Foot and Ankle Society, Vice President Tamil Nadu Arthroscopy Society, Joint Secretary and Treasurer of the Indian Arthroscopy Society. Uh, he is head arthroscopy foot and ankle unit in Ganga Hospital and uh, very often called for international uh, society meetings. Over to you, Dr. Sundarajan. Foot is going through a long, long way now from uh, removing the uh, bump to repair of the most common uh, ankle sprain that is there arthroscopically. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Uh, and also, <coughs> and uh, thank uh, MUA boys for uh, putting up to present here. So, so I have, I mean, I came to know only yesterday's in video presentation. So I have a few slides about the lateral ankle instability, how to diagnose and uh, how to address it. So please bear with me. So I will talk about uh, a case of 18 years old female patient. Uh, she's a badminton player of uh, Maldives. She presented with the recurrent ankle instability of one and a half years uh, because of the twisting injury, which she had while playing badminton in a tournament. And she continued with play with the strain, but uh, then later on, because of the recurrent instability, she couldn't play. And on examination, she had a lax ankle, anterior dryad positive. Of course, she had a dimpling of skin on the lateral aspect and the posse inversion and the varus of the foot. Range of movements were full. So that is the x-ray, uh, almost it's a normal x-ray. And you see an MRI finding there is a uh, lax ATFL. There is a continuity of the fibers, but, uh, the, but it is very lax. And also you can see that uh, uh, CFL is intact. So this is a, one of the commonest source of ankle dysfunction, the dysfunction. So most often, as you see in this case, ATFL is the most common culprit, but very rarely it can combine with the calcaneal fibular ligament. And as I think all of you are aware that what we are talking about is the uh, anterior tail of fibular ligament, which is connecting from fibula to the talus. And the more some of them, sometimes it uh, combines with the CFL, that is a calcaneal fibular ligament. So, so most often they say that people, some of them say that it's a single sleeve, which is connecting this both ATFL and the CFL. And we know that the most common injury is the inverse and stress in the plantar flexed ankle resulting in this uh, uh, sprain later on leads to the instability. And when you examine this kind of chronic lateral instability, I think we should be very careful and examine the foot and ankle malalignment, anything like in the knee joint. So any ligament surgery will not succeed if you don't correct that malalignment of the bony pathology. So most common associated pathology could be an varus heel, which is very, very, very important to note and correct the deformity before you correct that ankle instability. Sometimes you can have a flat foot or a cavus foot. And also it's important to examine for the tight gastro. So that could be a culprit, culprit sometimes that you may need to do with some release along with your lateral uh, instability surgery. So other important examination which you should do is a generalized ligament laxity that you should compare with the opposite side. And the commonest test which we do is an anterior dryer test where you hold the tibia firmly and try to translate anteriorly your uh, talus so that can cause abnormal translation. Uh, uh, this is how you do this, your anterior uh, uh, dryer test, where you can most often in clinically, it is in the room, it's very difficult. Most often it could be a negative, but in the examination table, it could be a positive. But same time, the negative test doesn't rule out the ATF injury and the recurrent instability. So that is not a mandatory test. Or you can do a talatil test. It is very is positive only if it is associated with the calcaneal fibular ligament. But however, it is all not positive all the time. So MRI is one of the most sensitive examination where you have a 100% sensitity for ATFL and 83% uh, uh, specificity for CFL. But they have a very low sensitivity, which we talked about, 56% of uh, only for ATFL and 50% for CFL. So that, that's why the intact fibers doesn't rule out recurrent instability. 
and also MRI helps you to find out the osteochondral lesion so that preoperatively you can plan for uh, osteochondral lesion management too. And also it gives you the prognosis, uh, these kind of uh, medial lesions, which is very commonly associated with the lateral ankle instability, which you should expect when you do a reconstruction. When you come to surgical management, there are two kind way of doing, whether it's a non-anatomical and anatomical. I'm going to, I'm not going to talk anything about non-anatomical because we are not uh, uh, doing any non-anatomical procedures uh, in uh, world over because of the, the lot of failures and, uh, and people slowly change it into the anatomical procedures. When you do an anatomical procedure, whether you do a repair or reconstruction, when you do a repair or reconstruction, whether you can do an open or we can do an arthroscopy. So when you do a repair means what, what you do, you directly you are doing the direct repair of the HGFL along with, with or without inferior external, external retinocular augmentation. When you do a reconstruction, you do with atograft with the peroneus brevis, or we can do an allograft, or uh, you can do with even ham Graceli's or semitendinosis atografts, or we can do an arthroscopic in the same thing. If you want to do a direct repair, the most important is you should have an adequate ligament remnants. That is very important for pre-request. If it is uh, not there, or if it is an associated with a generalized ligament laxity, or if it is a failed procedures, or if you have a if you are not having good tissues, or if it is in a uh, body mass index is very heavy, then you do an anatomical reconstruction. This is the concept when you do a lateral ankle instability. There are many procedures have been described when you do an open procedure. So most common procedure is the brostrum procedure where you do a direct to direct repair. When you do a brostrum gold procedure where you do an augmentation with the inferior extensor retinoculum along with the ATFL repair, almost like a double pressing, or like in the Carlson procedure where you do a direct bony tunnels in the fibula and take both ATFL and CFL and do the uh, take the uh, sutures outside the fibula posterior to that and the repair. So this is when you do an arthroscopy also, most often we do the direct repair where you do a direct bites over the ATFL and do the tunnel or you can do it with the anchor repair. So when you do an arthroscopy repair, the, you can use it with the regular 30 degrees 4 mm scopes. And what you require is a standard anteromedial and astrolateral portal. So a viewing portal is the anteromedial portal and the working portal is the anterolateral portal. When you use your knotted technique, you may use a micro lasso to take a percutaneous stitches over there and shuttle the sutures. Or when you use a knotless, sometimes you can just manage with the two portals where you can use some uh, uh, low profile uh, instruments like a knee scorpion, take a bites and just put an anchor to the fibula. As already I discussed, anything to do an arthroscopic repair, direct repair, you need a good quality tissue. So when you do an arthroscopy, you can see the lateral side that is a syntosmosis. And what we are seeing, that is the anterior portion of your fibula where your ATFL is getting attached. You remove all the uh, debrided tissues from the uh, fibula end and cure it with your uh, small uh, uh, ring curettes so that you freshen the bone and create a biology uh, for your ATFL uh, uh, tissues to go and get attached and heal very well. So once you are done, then this is the remaining tissue of your ATFL tissues. So you can take a bite through the, uh, this kind of low profile instruments like a knee scorpion. Uh, you can take a two bites, you can do that the double loaded and you can use it is either a, make a tunnel in the uh, femur, which we showed in the diagram in the previous slide. You can make two tunnels. You can take the both the bites through the uh, tunnel and take it through the posterior side and you can just tie it up, make a small percutaneous incision. Or you can take your bites with the fiber wires and you can use the uh, uh, knotless uh, anchors like a push lock, just we can insert uh, both up and down with a single or two anchors. So that will give you the repair of ATFL to the uh, bone, uh, fibula. When you use a, when you use a uh, knotted, you use a first anchor in the fibula, then you take a micro lasso and take your sutures and tie it up. What about the results of arthroscopic repair? There are excellent results that have been reported in the literature. When you compare even open and arthroscopic, there are very few papers. Uh, I think that the Matsushi paper has given a uh, very good uh, uh, comments, especially in the pain relief and less pain relief, uh, uh, less pain uh, postoperatively compared to the open procedure. However, they found no significant difference in clinical scores between the groups at one year post-op. So still it's uh, arthroscopic techniques, a good one if the tissues are very good. 
what but the case which i showed that previous uh, uh, i mean uh, x ray and mri has got a very lax joint and the anterior dry test was positive and in this case we decided to do an open procedure uh, you can you can see that there is that syndesmosis of the joint that is the anterior inferior tibiofibular uh, ligament and uh, when you see the joint it's so lax and it's open up because of the chronic laxity and she also has got a mild generalized laxity not very huge which required a reconstruction we see the posterior aspect of the joint is very much open so when you see a this much big opening then we thought there is some mild generalized ligament uh, ligament laxity is also is involved in this patient so i thought i'd have a better do an open procedure in this case when you do an open procedure you do the same lateral incision here the CV, cfl is intact then you uh, incise the atfl from the center and reflect that one portion here and this is the remaining atfl then is a double loaded all inside anchor was inserted in that fibula which we saw in the uh, what you saw in that arthroscopic view this is an open procedure so this is a double loaded uh, four stitches has been taken through the remaining atfl which is attached to the talus so here taking all the bites uh, to the uh, uh atfl which is attached to the talus once you are done that then you do the uh, plantigrade position and slight aversion this is very important to keeping the foot in this position and then you do the all the knotting of the uh, you are all the four stitches so once you done the knotting of the uh, anchors then you had to do a, a, a brast to gold procedure where you just include the uh, inferior extensor retinaculum which you are going to see here so what we are going to do it is almost like a double pressing where you take a bites to the inferior extensor retinaculum and also i take bites through the remaining fibers which are attached to the fibula we can see that is the inferior extensor retinaculum and the other fibers which are separated in the fibula were included in that bites so it is almost like a double pressing so that will give you a very good stability in the lateral side and you can see that after doing all the knots then you cut it with a knife and you can see the check the stability it's a very good stable ankle so if you see the literature uh, uh, in the even the open procedure always because already it's a proven even the long term follow up up to 90 years they have around 93% of results recently people started adding internal bracing too where you can do an augmentation with the suture tape along with the repair if the tissue quality is not very good where the some of the paper had suggested that uh, repair with the internal brace almost as as long as strong as the native atfl and they say that uh, uh, it biomechanical study also has given the similar results when you compare the native atfl and the repaired atfl with the uh, uh, internal bracing as already discussed anatomical atfl reconstruction whether you use an atograft or allograft what you do you do a tunnel in the fibula tunnel in the talus whether you take the stripe of the peroneus brevis and put it one screw in the uh, fibula and the other screw in the talus and create an anatomical reconstruction you can reconstruct it with uh, allografts too again this is required only in the procedures which i told if there is a generalized ligament laxity when you have a high body mass index or a failed brostrum or very poor tissue then re reconstruction is recommended otherwise arthroscopic or open direct repair these patients are sufficient and they give a very good uh, uh, excellent uh, results if the tissue quality is very good thank you very much sir thank you sundar i think you have you have shown both the techniques so the people those who are listening to they can do it because it is not that difficult once you follow how sundar has explained beautifully both the arthroscopic and the open technique any okay. question antav sir uh sundar what is your uh, uh, rate of success in arthroscopic vis-a-vis open which you used to do earlier sir i mean arthroscopy is mainly in my early stages sir and most of my cases are still in open procedure that's why i want to do the open show the open also because still people even though there are two three uh, papers have shown very good results with arthroscopic uh, uh, repair still people is very are very skeptical about still arthroscopic repair because most of the time when you take bite you are taking a blind bites through the remaining scar tissues of the atl atfl still you don't know the good quality of the tissue whether how much you are taking and putting back to the fibula exactly, exactly. 
when you do the open procedure the other advantages you are uh, directly visualizing the fibers and if you are not uh, uh, and also you are adding in a gold procedure by inferior extensor retinaculum uh, even you can do an arthroscopy also we can include it but still when you do an open procedure you are taking a double pressing which is in some of the fibers which are attached to the fibula so when you do a double pressing you feel more confident and they may do very well but still arthroscopic people had given good results if there is a tissue quality is good yes nicolas sir one thing this same question i asked to once to nick van dyke that what is the commonest cause of your atfl failures he just told me people don't take the cfl along with that so that is the common mistake people do and that's why the probably your even the open techniques fail so this is for the lesson for for see, the, all the that's seniors that. and junior colleagues you have to take care of the cfl even yeah but uh, sometimes when you talk to them so they do even thermal shrinkage for the in some cases just to do the thermal shrinkage so when we discussed that day when i mean i was also at the webinar uh, so yeah 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 uh, so that's, you, Nick doesn't do the arthroscopic one he does only open one yes sir so yes. he he thinks that bo are both cfl and uh, atfl is a single structure so he takes a, a sleeve and reattach to the fibula uh, from uh, superior to inferior so he doesn't just repair atfl okay he takes no, he, no, take, no. he takes he takes both both the things yeah. so nendu can we go uh, to the next speaker please Yes, sir. You are the boss. I now call upon Dr. Uh, Bahe Gaungar, uh, uh, very uh, famous uh, personality in wrist and upper limb uh, surgery. Uh, he is trained from uh, uh, America. Uh, has done lot of work, lot of research work. He now works at uh, Jangir and Sancheti uh, Institute of Orthopedics and Rehabilitation. lot of uh, pa papers and uh, contribution to chapters in uh, wrist arthroscopy uh, he will talk to us on uh, arthroscopic tennis elbow release i must tell you something about this when way back uh, about 12 or 15 years back when sachin tendulkar had a tennis elbow every patient was talking about tennis elbow tennis elbow so i had a patient who was given conservative treatment so i did ten, uh, release on one side and she said do on the other side also i said no no you be careful let us see what is going to happen after the first one over to you dr bai uh, ka thank you thank you very much sir it is indeed a privilege to be amongst the giants of arthroscopy and orthopedics and i want to thank the um, indian orthopedic association the ias and team momentum for this opportunity and uh, my task today is to talk about uh, operative treatment of lateral epicondylitis with some emphasis on an uh, arthroscopic release and uh, my disclaimer uh, although for financial is none but for uh, management is that my threshold for operation or advising surgery uh, in patients with lateral epicondylitis is extremely high so uh, i think everyone who is listening to this talk should take this with a pinch of salt that surgery is not the first uh, uh, resort that we uh, encourage but only in patients who have failed a reasonable uh, trial of non operative treatment as we all know it's a very festive occasion and i would like to um uh, uh wish you all uh, lord ganpati is the uh, lord of uh, knowledge so this uh, webinar is uh, at an apt time and pune is so beautiful the western ghats during the monsoons and um, uh, unfortunately because of the covid lockdown uh, we are not able to enjoy these sights as we did uh, the last year but hopefully the next year will bring a ray of light so the learning objectives for this talk uh, is to talk a little bit about the background of the epidemiology uh, the pathoanatomy and uh, this was highlighted by dr milind pimprikar sir that this is an enthesopathy and uh, we should understand the difference between tendinitis and uh, a very important concept which is tendinosis uh, we will talk a little bit about uh, the diagnosis and then we'll go on to the treatment options so the ten, the term tennis elbow was uh, coined in the 1880s and uh, we all know that it is the most frequent reason why patients will come to the clinic with uh, pain uh, in the elbow 
It is most often seen in the fourth to the fifth decades, and there is no specific preponderance in the male and the female gender. And uh, surprisingly, it is, uh, and I'm sure that everyone will concede, it is more commonly seen in people um, who are uh, not sport, sport, sportive or in non-athletes as well. And uh, in the Western literature, it was found that 50% uh, were recreational tennis players. So the term comes from um, the, these uh, uh, strokes that lay an excessive force on the lateral aspect of the elbow. And it was thought that uh, this might be one of the reasons why people have lateral epicondylitis. Uh, and it is seen usually in racket sports or in throwing sports, but occupation also has a very, very important uh, role and we see it in people who have repetitive injuries, uh, repetitive tasks with heavy work, such as butchers and plumbers and uh, people who have uh, to work with their hand in the frontal plane and away from the body. And uh, it is very uh, pertinent to also understand that it is not always the extensor carpi radialis brevis that is affected, but in uh, reducing frequency, we find involvement of the extensor digitorum communis, the radialis longus, and the carpial naris as well. And then the pathoanatomy that we alluded to between uh, the difference between the tendinitis and the tendinosis is highlighted in this slide. Tendinosis is because of a fibroblast infiltration and a vascular hyperplasia plasia with a disorganized collagen formation. And we call this as angiofibroblastic hyperplasia, and that is the basic pathoanatomy in uh, these conditions, be it tennis elbow, be it Achilles, tendinitis, or tendinosis. And uh, it is thought that uh, the angiofibroblastic tendinosis occurs because of overuse and repetitive microtrauma. Uh, but we don't know why the pain uh, is so pronounced because there are usually no inflammatory cells and uh, people think it may be because of micro tears or maybe capsular tears and that can explain the pain. And besides the, uh, uh, the origin of the common extensors, the other locations have been mentioned here. We will not belabor too much on that. And a histopathology typically looks like this, and you will see that there is no cellular pattern here, and there is disorganized collagen with vascular or angiofibroblastic hyperplasia. The differential diagnosis is important to keep in mind, and the most frequent are those of radial tunnel syndrome and intraarticular pathology, such as radiocapitular arthritis, uh, a radial head fracture, an occult radial head fracture or osteochondritis desiccans. There may be synovial plica, which can also be one of the most important causes of lateral sided elbow pain, elbow instability, such as the posterior lateral rotator instability, and then proximal causes such as cervical radiculopathy or even thoracic outlet compression syndrome for that matter. Patient, uh, uh, you know, most characteristically presents with pain that is localized on the lateral aspect of the elbow. Uh, the pain increases on strenuous activity, and um, there is usually no swelling, and there are no mechanical symptoms such as snapping or uh, locking or catching, which is very typically seen in osteochondritis, desiccans, or loose bodies in the elbow. Uh, physical examination, again, would reveal uh, tenderness, and this is most commonly about five millimeters distal and anterior to the lateral epicondyle which uh, overlies the origin of the extensor carpi radialis brevis. And then you have certain provocative tests that would reproduce the pain. Um, and uh, all of these coupled with the uh, patient history and sometimes with um, additional investigations would clinch the diagnosis of uh, lateral epicondylitis or tennis elbow. A characteristic MR finding would be so, a T1 and a T2 weighted image. And you can see the thickening of the common extensor origin with a signal change in the T2 weighted image. Here you can see uh, a plica that is invaginating into the uh, radiocapital joint. 
And then this particular image shows that there is not only thickening and per perhaps a partial tear, but also a plica that is invaginating on coronal and sagittal images. Uh, like I said, uh, treatment is usually non-operative. Uh, recently, I was very privileged to be a part of the Elbow Roundtable Conference at the International Federation of Societies of Surgery of the Hand in uh, Berlin. And all the uh, giants and the who's who in upper limb surgery uh, were on the round table. And uh, without exception, the consensus was in tennis elbow, you should defer surgery as far as possible. Let the patient ask for surgery. And uh, your go-to would be non-operative treatment. And this has to be shown uh, to be effective in a very large majority of people. And only those people who fail non-operative treatment for over a year and uh, who are really uh, bothered by this condition and are asking for surgery should be advised surgery and should be undertaken for surgery. And then again, in properly selected patients, more than 90% will have uh, optimum outcomes. A very quick review about the conservative treatment protocols for pain or activity modification, uh, NSAIDs, contrast bath, massage, and modifying the grip uh, uh, for including uh, larger or span grip is, uh, is encouraged. Uh, you can um, even try bracing and uh, injections at times, but there is no concrete or conclusive evidence to uh, prove the efficacy of different injection techniques, right from steroids to autologous blood to, um, to PRP or even stem cells for that matter. Uh, very quickly, a schematic diagram to show you the open technique. Uh, and this is basically where you would release the extensor copy radialis brevis origin, debride the endosurface, make multiple drill holes, and then resuture the extensor origin. Um, and uh, that will usually provide for pain relief. Some people also add a denervation procedure of the sensory branches to the elbow joint. Uh, but that may be a little bit uh, uh, extensive kind of a procedure. Uh, we have also described a technique uh, for the management of chronic lateral epicondylitis, which was recently published. And essentially, it uh, includes a modification of the Nurschel and the Kundra technique. And there are four steps in this particular uh, procedure where we decompress the posterior interosseous nerve uh, because we believe that it is a very important contributor to um, lateral epicondyl. And we, we, we confirmed that preoperatively with uh, clinical examination. We go ahead and perform an arthrotomy and excise any hypertrophic synovium or a plica. We make multiple drill holes in the lateral epicondyl after having debrided the undersurface of the ECRB. And then we offload the tendon by reattaching it about a centimeter uh, distal to its actual origin. And we believe that uh, this particular technique combines different procedures that have been described in literature and provides a very effective manner of uh, avoiding the recurrence or relapse of the condition. So these are clinical pictures. You can see the uh, posterior interosseous nerve being decompressed here. And then you reattach the extensor copy uh, radialis brevis, a rhomboid-shaped origin about a centimeter distal to its actual origin, and you suture it to the surrounding tendons. And we make a transosseous tunnel to put in our sutures. Uh, the other way to deal with uh, tennis elbow and uh, video technique that I'll be elaborating in a bit is arthroscopic release. And uh, what is important is to understand what exactly are we releasing? One of the biggest problems is releasing the LUCL, which may cause elbow instability, and you have to be very careful about it. So this region, so we are viewing from the uh, anteromedial portal, this is a capitalum, this is a radial head. So this region is where the extensor carpi radialis brevis would be. So you need to release this area, and then if you find pathologies in other areas, you may want to uh, release those areas also. So there is a classification that has been described by Champel Baker. I will not belabor too much on this again. Uh, it's out there for you to refer to. So we prefer to use the uh, lateral decubitus position because uh, at times we may also have to augment the LUCL and we find it easier to do it this way. Um, so the standard bony landmarks, we palpate the medial and the lateral epicondyles, mark the medial and the lateral supra 
uh, Condola bridges. You mark the proximal uh, ulna and the olecranon, and then that would give you an idea about the triangle of the elbow, and that is the uh, ulna nerve that is being highlighted out here. With that out of your way, you go ahead by marking your primary viewing portal. We prefer to begin with the uh, proximal uh, anteromedial portal, which is about two centimeters proximal and two centimeters anterior to the medial epicondyle. And then once we have done that, you uh, mark the soft spot, uh, which is lying between the triangle connecting the lateral epicondyle, the olecranon, and the uh, uh, and the radial head. And once you have done that, you uh, pass in a hypodermic needle and insufflate the joint with about five to 10 cc of normal saline. And you look for the piston coming back and that would give you uh, the, the, con the confirmation that you're, uh, that you're uh, in, the, in the joint. Uh, the trocar and the cannula comes in from the medial side. You're all the time against the anterior surface of the humerus at all times and anterior to the medial septum so that uh, you are keeping the ulnar nerve out of harm's way and an egress of the fluid would again confirm and you feel that little pop as you enter the, the joint. You see that you can see the pop there that's the pop and you know that you are in the joint at that point in time. Um, arthroscopy begins with, uh, uh, with a diagnostic round and in this particular gentleman who was uh, about 68 years of age, you can see the cause was a hypertrophic annular ligament, a lot of synovitis and a defect on the radial head, uh, an osteochondral defect out there. So this was the cause of his lateral uh, elbow pain along with a micro tear in the ECRB. So you go ahead, complete your diagnostic round. You look at the tracking of the trochlea uh, in, the, uh, in the gutter, anterior gutter. Look for any capsular tears. And then you would begin your therapeutic uh, uh, round by getting in uh, your shavers to take out the synovium and oops. And then uh, we also like to use some radio frequency to uh, shrink the tissue. So here is a hypertrophic lateral, uh, hypertrophic annular ligament that is being uh, taken off. We use uh, the RF. Uh, it is thought that this also creates some denervation kind of an effect, uh, which is uh, useful in pain reduction and um, take off the annular ligament superficial part so that uh, uh, this has been shown to be one of the important contributory factors for tennis elbow. And once that's done, you um, again do a diagnostic round and a lavage and you come out. So you should start seeing the muscle belly on the lateral side to confirm that you have done an adequate release of the capsule and the ECRB do not uh, damage the LUCL and that is extremely important to understand and prevent lateral, uh, posterior lateral rotatory instability of the elbow joint. Post-operative protocol is um, usually protected range of movement uh, against the belly in about three weeks and then we encourage progressive range of movement. Uh, we begin with isometric exercises and then progress to strengthening of the muscles. Uh, however, we are very careful in advising the patients not to carry out strenuous activity, especially in front of the body uh, for a minimum duration of three months and at times for non-compliant patients uh, for almost up to about six months for an effective outcome of this particular procedure. There are several studies out there in literature which have uh, concluded that there is no such distinct advantage of arthroscopic over open release uh, apart from the fact that there is uh, perhaps an early return to work in the arthroscopic group uh, and there is better uh, cosmesis. And uh, besides that, there is no such distinct advantage. At times, uh, people argue that uh, intra-articular pathology, uh, uh, removal of loose bodies or uh, such uh, different pathologies uh, can be better diagnosed. You can also have the opportunity to look at the posterior gutter at times and that perhaps uh, is the advantage of uh, arthroscopy. So in summary, tendinosis is mainly of the ECRB. It is a degeneration and not an inflammation. Uh, uh, we we uh, 
at times uh, ask for histopathology, especially in open cases. Non-operative treatment is your primary resort. It is extremely uh, helpful and successful in a very large majority. Uh, and you have to be very patient, talk to your uh, uh, patients and uh, encourage them to persevere with the non-operative treatment. And uh, operative treatment is only indicated when people fail non-operative tr uh, treatment for at least a year. And then uh, uh, we should bear in mind that uh, there is no such testing advantage of arthroscopy. And this is something that we need to counsel our patients for. And uh, with that, again, I uh, thank the leadership of the IOA and the IAS for the opportunity to speak here. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Abhijit. It is always a pleasure to listen to you, always. As usual, we'll learn something from your whatever you will tell and we'll learn every time I listen to Abhijit, you. Abhijit, great talk. Okay. I have a question. So yes, I yes. think, I think, uh, is there any... Abhijit, yes. yes. Abhijit? Yes, go ahead. Yes, Good yes. Day. Hi, how are you? I'm doing well, thank you. Enjoy uh, your talk. Thanks a lot. Uh, I mean, please don't mind, but could the pain in that uh, case you showed be because of the radial head cartilage issue rather than the ECRB tear? Yes, pretty much. He, so this is the advice. So these are very, uh, what do you call, uh, uh, outlier cases where arthroscopy has a distinct advantage over an open procedure. You saw that it was pretty much on the medial uh, aspect of the radial head. I would have missed that if I would have done an open procedure. Now, since this gentleman did not have an element of radial tunnel syndrome or posterior interosseous nerve involvement, uh, we decided to offer him arthroscopic treatment. And uh, it was, and this this injury was, or this uh, degeneration was not picked up on the MRI. So it came as a big surprise. And uh, so the, the uh, advantage, so when people talk about uh, what is the advantage of arthroscopy over an open procedure, are these uh, outliers or very small cohort of patients where you may miss um, uh, this lesion. Now, I don't know how much, uh, how much effect it is going to have on the outcome because that's a degenerative kind of uh, uh, cartilage lesion that he had. We just debrided it and left it alone. Um, but yes, it helps in diagnosis. If there is a loose body, you may pick it up and remove it, especially if it is on the medial aspect of the elbow, which you may not see on a lateral arthrotomy. So yes, I would, I would agree. But this gentleman did have uh, a pain relief, uh, although it took him some time. It took him almost seven months to uh, recover completely. Uh, but uh, I would say that there, there, there is certainly a contribution of other factors uh, apart from the ECRB that would contribute to lateral elbow pain. Great. Thanks. Thanks. Yes, Thank yes. yes, I think I think the, the way when we did our postgraduate, people told like you have to just take off just one. If you incise something, if you just incision and take off the whatever there is on the lateral side, it will cure. It is not like that because the last 20, 25 years, the tennis elbow has, it has been it's grown in a different way probably. And even when we do arthroscopy, now we can manage that. Somebody, if people is not agreeing that for the open operation, we can do the arthroscopically. And this is a nice gesture from Abhijit and his the hand and wrist guys that they have taught us how to do it. Thank you, Abhijit. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. So I think, I think, Sreyas, I think uh, uh, Antao sir has an emergency surgery, so he has to leave. So I think uh, we can go ahead with the permission of the other faculties. Uh, Darshan, you can, you, are you ready with your talk? Yeah, yeah, I'm ready. So you, you just start your slides here. If there is no question for Abhijit, I think Darshan is starting. Abhijit, okay? Yeah. Okay, can I go ahead? Okay, Darshan, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, at the onset, I would like to thank uh, Maharashtra Orthopedic Association and the uh, Indian Orthopedic Association, as well as the IAS. So my topic, basically what I was told was a video session. So I'm just keeping it short, mainly focusing on the video and a uh, uh, little bit of uh, theory. So I would start with the first the volar wrist ganglion, because these are the less common than the uh, dorsal wrist ganglion. So indication, before I go about the indication, first thing is I don't operate on all ganglions. Second thing is I don't remove all ganglions arthroscopically. So these are some of those cases where, uh, where do they arise from is one of the issue when we start uh, deciding whether this has to be removed. So basically it can arise from the radioscaphoid uh, ligaments, 
scapulonate interval, scapotrapezial joint as well. These are the ones which are difficult and metacarpotrapezial. So the, usually the first two are the easily, uh, you, you will be able to easily remove, that's the radius scapot and scapulonate intervals. So what are the portals we use when we are trying to take out the volar uh, risk angiogram? That is one, two portal and the three, four portal are most commonly used. There are various approaches to do it, but these are the one common portals which I use. So where do I look for? So a lot of times in many literature, they say you don't do an MRI, but I am quite fond of doing an MRI too. If at all, I'm going to take out and uh, ganglion arthroscopically. This gives me the exact location. I'll show you some of those cases where you find a lot more accuracy when you're trying to remove or else you'll be blindly shaving that part of the capsule because a lot of the times when you go inside or basically when you do an arthroscope, you may not find the exact site of the pedicle. Whereas if you do an MRI, that gives you an advantage that where exactly you need to look for and what is the area of the capsule which you need to remove. Mm. So these are the interligamentous gap between the, this is the common site where it arises. That's the interligamentous gap between the radioscapho capitate and the long radiolunate ligaments. So typically this is what is the site when you're trying to see the uh, uh, volar wrist ganglion which arises. So you need to be careful that the radial artery is quite close the median nerve or even the cutaneous branch of the median nerve will be somewhere here, which is what, uh, which you need to be uh, careful because these are the, some of the complications which can arise when you're trying to take out the volar wrist ganglion. Because volar wrist ganglion per se is a lot more easier to remove than the dorsal wrist ganglion because it's just bang in front of you. But these are the other disadvantages what you could, there could be some complications if not taken care. So this is the shaver which you are viewing through the 3-4 portal and then you can use your shaver to uh, from the 1-2 portal to access this ganglion. So some of the clinical tips is, as I told, the stock is not absorbed arthroscopically in most cases. So you need to be careful. Gentle pressure on the ganglion or the bulge on the outside. When you press on the ganglion from outside with the scope instead, you can see the bulge of the synovium and the capsule to the arthroscope, which is quite useful uh, trip to uh, uh, trick to take it out, excise the ganglion tip. And one centimeter of the capsule has to be removed around that stock. So that is quite important. If you do inadequate resection, then again, there is a chance of recurrence or incomplete removal, as there could be some septations. So other options, dye, which you can use injected methylene blue inside the, this thing. But uh, I have no experience with the dye, as well as intraoperative ultrasound. These I feel these two are more uh, complicating things uh, for a simple thing. So advantages are awards dissection and scarring and the relative are the uh, relative indications, which is like concomitant intra-articular pathology also can be uh, identified. So these are some of the complications like recurrence, almost zero to 20%, which is almost akin with the open procedures and superficial palmar branch of the radial artery or the pseudoaneurysm is also one of them. And the median nerve or the cutaneous branch of the median nerve can also be damaged. So clinical points, the other point which you need to identify means uh, when you want to recognize the STT joint, if at all, if the ganglion is arising. So it will be usually distal to the distal wrist crease. This is the area where it will be, if at all, if it is arising from the uh, STT joint or else it will be much more proximal. Larus ganglion, it's one of them. So basically, this is the common typical site of the ganglion which arises. So this is the usual incision, if at all we were to take it out arthroscopically. This is what, what I was talking about, the pedicle which arises from there. The, between the two divisions of the radial artery, this is what the stock. So when you're trying to take it out arthroscopically, you, if you plunge your shaver much deeper, so there is a possibility that you could damage one of these arteries. That is a cyst. Which, this is a case wherein the volar risk ganglion was quite painful. That was an indication. So you can see which is prominent on the dorsiflexion. That's an MRI which you can see that the ganglion cyst is typically arising between the FCR and the first compart first extensor retinaculum and compartment. And this is the radial artery here. You can see this. That's the radial artery. And this is the pedicle of the cyst which you can approach it. You can excise it from, you can visualize from 3-4 portal. These are the sagittal cuts when you see this. And again, you can see from, you're seeing from, so this is exactly between the radial lunar tr tricotral ligament. This is a pedicle which you need to. So this is the traction tower or the board which we use. There are various types of traction which you could use. So that's the ganglion. I'm going through the three, four portal.
So once you are inside, you need to visualize that uh, these are the radial lunate ligament and the radial scapho scapho capitate ligament. So you can see there's a lot of hyperemia on that side. That was what then you check on the ulnar side as well. Once you see that that was quite okay, that's a pre-stylo recess. Now again, you go back towards the radial side. So I'm pressing this ganglion from outside. You can see some capsular bulge here when I'm pressing from the ganglion, that's a capsular bulge. So these are the areas where it is there from here, this angle and towards all the. So you make another portal that is the one, two portal. This is the one, two portal, which you are doing it. You're visualizing through the three, four portal. So once you make the one, two portal, that's the one, two portal, which you may do it. So insert your shaver. I, this is a dry arthroscopy what I am doing it. So it's quite good if at all we are able to establish, do this procedure through dry arthroscopy because it will confirm exactly the whenever you rupture the, or the open out the ganglion. So I'm doing uh, some amount of synovectomy there. So that's the area where exactly, if at all you plunge it further, this thing you can see the capsule. So now I have the open, that's a cyst. You can see it well when I'm pressing from outside, then now you can see that bulge cyst of the ganglion, you can see it well. So go uh, uh, much more radially towards the another site because this was the site what we detected through the MRI, but between the radio lunar tricuter ligaments. Uh, now you see, once I plunged it, you can see the cyst is opened up. That's a mucinous fluid coming out of the ganglion. So you need to excise, spare the ligament, just excise the rim of the capsule on, on uh, between the ligaments as well as on either side of the ligament as well. So that is the capsule which I'm shaving off. So you go on, on much more radially as well. So you need to be careful that you don't plunge your shaver much more deeper. So once you see that's the depression after the excision of this thing, ganglion, you can see that. So that is typically you start your mobilization of the day two, wound closure and mobilization, less scarring and faster rehab. So speaking about the dorsal wrist ganglion, uh, basically the proposed advantages are as for better visualization as you are able to treat interarticular pathology because dorsal wrist ganglion can be associated scapholuminate ligament injury as well because most of these start with an onset of a fall or something because dorsal, of dorsal wrist ganglion and more satisfying cosmetic results because your bump is not replaced with a scar and improved recovery with earlier return to work. Most commonly, it originates from the membranous portion of the scapholunate ligament. Occasionally, a ganglion cyst may herald underlying pathologies, such as what I told as scapholunate ligament. So this is a septum, which you can see. This is scapholunate ligament on either side, on the dorsal side, and this is a septum where it is. So typically, a ganglion arises from this region and can extend into the midcarpal joint or to the radiocarpal joint. So that is where, again, in the MRI, and this is the dorsal capsule ligamentous complex, which is sometimes you need to take off this as well so that you clear off all the ganglion extensions, both the radiocarpal as well as the midcarpal joint. The dorsal capsular reflection serves as a part of the barrier, as I told, uh, between these two uh, compartments at the level of the SL joint. Some of the operative pearls when you're doing is uh, debride, the, uh, debride until approximately 1.1 centimeter of the 1 to 1 1.5 centimeter capsule has been removed. Some of the common mistake is to make a capsulotomy, capsulotomy is if at all it is too small, Another common mistake is to create an incomplete capsulotomy that fails to communicate with the extra articular space or the SL should be repaired. And if at all you find a scapholunate ligament, that can be repaired. So, so typically this is the dorsal wrist ganglion. You can see that. So I get an, as I told, I usually prefer to get an MRI if at all I'm doing arthroscopically. So this is a scaphoid, this is a lunate. You can see the ganglion between the two compartments here. And dorsally, you can see this. That's the pedicle of the ganglion arising from the radiocarpal joint. You can see this part, that's a lunate. Again, this is a cyst which is going all around this thing. That's outline of the cyst. So this one of the traction which I'm using. So typically you mark the 
area because after instance so one two portals and three four portal or six are these are the three portals which are commonly used so i you can use interchangeably either you start with a six or r one two portal i tend to use the first one two portal that is a lot more easily so you are viewing alnar side so basically you need to look for the, that's a lunate that's a triquitrum and this is a dorsal capsular ref reflection this is a dorsal capsule you go about this is a bluish cyst you can bluish dorsal capsule part which you can see which i am pressing from outside you can see that's that's a cyst which needs to be removed so that's communicating with here between the uh, much further you need to come closer to the between the scapulonate interval so once you so the, i try doing this one with a dry scope but after some time it's difficult because the dorsal capsule goes um, the minute you do another portal the collapse the capsule collapses without uh, a fluid it's quite difficult to do it so this is what you can see the bluish glistening cyst now you can see this thing and lot of synovite is around probably that was the cause of the pain so your scope is you're seeing through the one two portal and you're operating through the uh, debriding through the 6r portal so you debride this those uh, it's quite often you see this kind of synovitis whenever a patient complains of lot of pain for means when you find sometimes these ganglions can be unusually painful so now you can see the turbulence of the fluid the minute i am trying to slowly shave off the synovitis and as well as the pedicle of the capsule you can see the small amount of turbulence in the other changing the consistency of the fluid that shows that uh, that's a cystic mucinous fluid which is out of the uh, ganglion cyst so you need to excise that part of the capsule you continue your debridement on the shaver so once you shave all that you should be careful that you could even debride the tendon so once you see this much of the tendons and you can move i am trying to glide the tendons and check out whether i have not removed injured any of those tendons this is one more one of the complications which could happen with the dorsal ganglion excision so you need to uh, take off a rim of almost a centimeter of the capsule so after excision these are the two tiny scars which you can see and also visualize the midcarpal portal as well so that's a depression after you excise the ganglion and you just leave it open you just put a steady strip dressing that's it another tips because some of sometimes you can see that some of these ganglions are like multiple septations because these are the cause where the patient can come back with the cause of with the pain again or recurrence of the ganglion so you need to excise all these multiple cysts which might be difficult to take it out so you need to get mri that's where i was telling you, mri is useful and use a artery or a, a nibbler or means a, a duct bill which can take off all those septations and separate this ganglion so which you need to take care take care, uh, ensure that that is completely excised some of the complications are few rare compared to the this thing some degree of loss of flexion which is always in the I mean, quite consistent in the case of whenever you are doing a, a dorsal wrist ganglion open surgeries but which regains over a period of time thank you for your kind attention thank you darshan so uh, abhijit or shreyas or anybody if there is any question we can take those and in the meantime i will try to share my screen okay, is it okay sandeep yeah sure abhijit you have any questions or um i don't have a question but a very quick observation and uh, something to share that uh, in my experience we find that uh, the ganglions is all those who come in or qualify for surgery about 60% of them have an underlying scapulonate ligament uh, uh, injury of some sort and i think it's very important to visualize uh, the ganglion cyst even from the mid carpal portal and then after you're done with the excision of the cyst we assess the scapulonate uh, articulation and we find that uh, usually there is some opening out a geisler kind of stage 2 or 3 kind of an injury i've even seen four and uh, we feel it is important that we repair the scapulonate ligament just like darshan mentioned so that is very important and second thing is just like in uh, lateral epicondylite is release you may injure the lucl in ganglion excision you may end up uh, injuring the radius k4 capitate ligament with an very over enthusiastic kind of an excision uh, and thus causing instability so these are the two caveats that i would like to share thank you 
Yeah, I do. Thank you. Great. Now, can we invite our dynamic secretary, Swanendu Samantha, to please give his talk on arthroscopic ankle arthrodesis? He's Spice. the last batsman, Spice. but he's going to score the century. No, no, no. Is, 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 is my screen coming, you know? Yes, sir. Yes, it is visible. It's really unfair on the last few speakers. I've been there, so but you guys have done a really great job and great presentations and techniques. So I, I'm the last one, last batsman. So, so I'm a bowler sort of thing. So, okay, so I have, I have come here as the 11th man. Probably I'm like Chandra Sekhar. So I'm not going to score, but I'll take some time over the screen. Okay. So I'll be I'll be talking, but I, I had some PowerPoint presentation, but I, I couldn't understand, but I really enjoying all the talks because we started at 10.30. Now it is like 2.30. So four hours is like a whole day of Iocon. Okay. So I'll be just going the, with the videos, not with the PowerPoint presentation. So the I do the arthroscopy, uh, ankle arthroscopy like this way. I don't put any sort of traction device. People say that it is it is better to use the traction device, but problem is that if you use the traction device, sometimes it is very hard to go ahead with your the lateral compartment viewing. So this was this lady was 62 years lady. His, her ankle was not they, not diagnosed properly. What was happening? She was limping, and you can see from the X-ray there is a lot of some osteolysis around the medial side. Also, there is some irregularity on the lateral side. Also, around the also the the tibio talus surface is not looking that great. So I thought, okay, I'll go ahead with some sort of uh, uh, diagnostic purpose, and I will do just the one biopsy. Then I'll see what is happening. So you know that uh, you like your Abhijit, so that it is better to inject with some fluid inside the joint, like your elbow in the ankle also. This, the fluid is coming back. You know that it's in the proper place. Skin marking is very important. And also you have to know that where is your superficial peroneal nerve? Because if you create the neuroma, then it is very, very painful. In the ankle, you know, this is the nick and spread, like your, what you do in the wrist. So it nick and nick and spread. You don't just use, uh, nick the skin, spread with the small mosquito, and the fast you create the anteromedial portal. So once I go ahead, you see, you see, it is everything was looking like white blotting paper sort of thing. So immediately, whenever you see this sort of picture inside any joint, then probably your first thinking should be like your mind. It might be tubercular. Okay. So you see the this, this the when when I went ahead, the whole cartilage is everything was my vision was completely been blocked. You see the fragmentation. So I probed it. I saw that it is all been broken. Is the hair So I. Uh, went ahead, I was doing this hydrophilic resection, you see, now I'm taking off the you know, same thing, you, you just, uh, you can, uh, sometimes you can uh, change it to the forward mode so that your, your saber blade can take some part of your tissue. And also you have to use the, use, you know, now you're taking, taking care of the sign of, you see, now it has started bleeding. Okay. So now they basically, when you go ahead with your ankle arthrodesis, remember, that you have to clear as many as much of surface you can clear because ankles are very very difficult to fuse so now you are taking the the same bar what we use for the acromion so i'm taking care of the now i'm taking off the tissue and also this big grasper is there i am taking off the all the fragments sometimes you might need the postural lateral portal because sometimes you are weaving weaving from the two portals you have to interchange Things. Sometimes you go weaving might be from the lateral side. Your barber sever will come from the medial side, or you will be you can interchange. Sometimes you have to take the postural lateral portal so that you can even clear that. You can see there every certain tissue has not been missed over there. So I use the cannulated screw 6.5. You see my my the, my my now I am weaving from the anterolateral side. You see. Now I'm seeing that it is from the distal tibial metaphysis. And the thing is that when you do that, you have to use that tap. Also, you have to use the CR so that you know that you are not going to the subtalar joint because you have to be very critical. And another one trick I want to tell the those who are, the, you see, now I'm tapping. Now, even I'm seeing with the, now I'm going from the lateral side, from the fibula. There are three techniques of doing it. One is you go from the medial side tibia, other side fibula. You go both the both the screws from the tibia, and sometimes nowadays people are doing with the people are doing with people are doing with like like you see another one trick I want to tell: don't compress the fast screw fully. 
because if you want if you just tighten the first screw fully you won't be able to see the second screw going in so just thread it tighten it so that you, still you can visualize that your guide wire and the, this thing is going properly and this is the way how we immobilize and this the biopsy came out to be tubercle this is a vision you see pre op picture and this is the lateral view you see this joint irregularity but if you do it perfectly then these are the two screws i usually do when i do arthroscopic angle both the some the tibia metaph metaphysis you can go ahead one tibia one from the fibula or else sometimes now people are advocating that two medial screws from the medial metaphysis tibia so this is the way you do it and once you do it perfectly and the thing is that the ankle is very hard to fuse you have to be very meticulous that you take care all the debris you uh, you denude the bone see the bleeding bone and then you go with these two screws and you have to cause us that you are not violating the subtalar joint thank you great uh, samantha so and really the chandrashekar scored a century so that was great uh, no, no, no. a lot so even i uh, i mean uh, as somebody mentioned earlier uh, that really doing an ankle arthrodes dr shinde i think if i remember it right doing an ankle arthrodes is arthrodes uh, arthroscopically is really uh, technology driven and uh, yeah, hats off to you well done even i do the same procedure and as you said uh, i do uh, medial screws uh, i use three medial screws so on the lateral they go from front to back uh, to ensure that you know there is enough tailor contacts and on the ap view they are uh, from proximal to distal so yes but the cross fixation is equally helpful and you can use these cannulated screws to advantage and it's very uh, happy to see these patients because the moment you do this they they are pain free or at least yeah, they yeah, that pain relief has started so they are very happy extremely good yeah great uh, any questions so from, uh, if you are doing elbow and wrist i am doing the ankle that upper part is taken care by you lower part i am taking now <laughs> remember i am to do a lot of very shoulders <laughs> yeah. you are doing everything swarnendra not just yeah. everything I think okay. this is an extremely talented bunch of people, uh, and with a very academic uh, side to them. So I'm very privileged and proud to be associated with you all. No, no, no. Okay. Thing is, people are really great. I am really the. Is it? I am lucky that I'm the secretary of an association for the people like you, Shreya, Sandeep. I don't have to do anything. I just have to just one make phone call, and they will do the rest. <laughs> you are yeah, trying to control everything very well from Kolkata, so that's that's important. It's yeah. going very well. Great. So I think yeah, Dr. So Shinde is still I logged think. in. Uh, so I don't know closing yes. remarks. Swanendra, you and Dr. Shinde. I think, think Swanendra, sir, you give the closing remarks. Sir is still there. If it is, uh, he is there. I think that will be the great. Okay, so th this was a great venture. This is because this is also from the uh, Indian Orthopedic Association, which is the mother association of uh, all of us, along with the Maharashtra Orthopedic Association and the Bombay Orthopedic Society, and uh, and the also the Indian Arthroscopic Society. So it is a great joint venture of the all four um, associations. So I think how we pass the we started exactly dot on ten thirty, and now it is like two twenty two. so four hours we are totally engrossed in academics and every lecture every interaction every question it was just too good and i was astonished to see how darshan abhijit shreyas and they and in this with this also the nayar how he demonstrated the superior capsular reconstruction and also my very old friend gopi they are doing great job so it is a great initiative and ias will be happy to again join this sort of as associated program with the uh, bombay orthopedic society and also the uh, iocon team thank you very much for your you. kind uh, and sharing your knowledge with all of us thank you, thank you. Thank i think sandeep you are the last person yeah. to conclude and so it all. was indeed a very good uh, webinar i would like to thank uh, indian arthroscopic association indian arthroscopy society moa and boa and along with the office bearers of ioa ias moa and bos and both the moderators dr nicholas antav and dr milin pimpriker indeed it was a very good webinar we had a very few uh, good talks from dr deepak goel jipen dr jipendra maheshwari dr ayyappan nayar dr pai gopinathan and dr milin pimprikar and there were excellent video presentations from dr shreyesh gajjar dr sundar rajan dr abhijit vahegaukar dr darshan jain and dr swarnendu samantha thank you all for your involvement and support and thank you very much all the viewers
And thanks, Great. Andy, for your technical Thank support. You. Well done, as always. Thank you.